So in case people don't know you, um, Andrew, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, you can see what my name is. Uh, I have a background in originally in software engineering, really. I worked in software engineering and uh, design development test fault finding for about 20 years and then um, ended up going into education and I now work for a UK university doing online technology tuition, the name of the university I'm not supposed to mention um, because they asked me not to. Uh, but that's the whole of the other story. Started researching alternative knowledge in about 2003, quite intensively with the advent of cheap broadband or cheaper broadband. And um, started to find out about 9-11 in about 2004. And uh, that led me eventually into contact with Dr. Judy Wood, at, I think towards the end of 2006, when we first, I uh, somehow got involved in an email group with herself and Dr. Morgan Reynolds. And um, also made contact with John Hutchison, uh, I think probably about a year after that. But I was already familiar with uh, John's work, John Hutchison's work, um, around about 1999 when I'd read a book which mentioned uh, some of the experiments we'd been doing. I think that was the first time I'd heard of it. Uh, but I may have even seen one or two clips on TV, actually, in these various paranormal documentaries back in the 80s. But I can't quite, I can't put as firm a date on that as I can on reading this book called The Electric UFO by Albert Budden, Budden which was given to me by a friend. So um, when Dr. Wood started to look into the Hutchinson effect, I thought, oh, yeah, that's, I've heard of that. And that's very interesting. And um, I think, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd also seen... Maybe I had seen Nick Cook's documentary when it was first released in 1999. And uh, John Hudson's mentioned in that, the hunt, uh, not the hunt for zero point, it's called Billion Dollar Secret, which was the documentary associated with Nick Cook's book, book The Hunt for Zero Point, which came out in the year 2000. And uh, I sort of followed uh, the research of Dr. Ward ever since. I've written two books about uh, the cover-up of her research and some of the people that were involved in that activity and I, what I think are the reasons for their involvement. Um, and Bob and I first met, I think, was it 2018, 2017? Uh, um, it was August the... Uh, 2018. 7th or something, it was Sunday... Uh, it's in my recent blog. I can tell you exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. it, was it was 2017. 2017. Yeah, uh, it was 6th of August 2017. Yeah, because yeah, we corresponded a bit and I ended up posting a comment on one of his blogs where he was discussing Dr. Wood's research and um, getting attacked for, for his mention of it in some way. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll elucidate on that a bit more. But um, yeah. that's how Bob and I came into uh, contact with each other. And uh, he shared a lot of his research since, which is um, uh, not exclusively to do with 9-11, but it's, it's, we've had quite a number of crossovers in our interests with the various phenomena that uh, he's been talking to people about, getting involved in experiments and researching, and that I've had an interest in both because of 9-11 and independent of 9-11, actually, Um and as I've said, I don't want to ramble on too much, but as I've, as I've said in other interviews, when I first got uh, my internet access on dial-up, which would have been uh, 1996, um, one of the first things I went looking for information for when I knew, sort of knew what a browser was and knew what a search engine was, was uh, Cold Fusion, because I wondered what happened to it, and I found some uh, very interesting information. I remember printing that all out and sticking it in a folder, um, and that was would have been 96, 97. And, uh, and th then I found that there was a lot of information, even back then, which uh, I hadn't come across elsewhere. So it was... Uh, and uh, very, very interesting to find that. Yeah, so uh, I can probably piggyback off the back of that. Um, I'm, I'm only going to be able to record the video in a higher quality. I don't want to waste any more time. So the audio should be captured in the cloud. If it isn't, then bad luck. <laughs> so um, let's see if there's anyone. Okay, so basically, <clears throat> I, I uh, came to this uh, subject 
um, uh, well, firstly, I was um, I was making a chimney in my garden. If people don't know what that is, it's kind of like a thing that you have in your garden, uh, which is like a it's a kind of a Mexican thing where they, it, it, it's it's you burn your even anthracite in it, which is the hottest burning coal you can get, and um, <clears throat> that is uh, <clears throat> uh, that is something that. Uh, um, uh, I was I basically bought this at a farmer's market at some farm show and I was assembling it in my garden on the morning of September 11th it had just been delivered and I was out in the garden I was assembling it and the, uh, the phone rang and I ran inside and uh, there was um, Fateh which was the father uh, Libyan father of my half Libyan girlfriend at the time and uh, he uh, told me uh, he says oh my god the Bible. Uh, terrible news, terrible news. I said, what's wrong with that? He says, uh, turn on the television, turn on the television. And so I turned on the television and this was after the first tower being hit um, and prior to the second tower being hit. And so I actually saw the, what, what was showed on the television as the tower being hit. Um, and so that was my journey. I was actually building a cast iron chimney uh, which is able to burn anthracite all day long for years and years and years and years and years and, years and uh, not uh, get warped or bent or anything. And I was being told on the television that kerosene um, was causing the Twin Towers, which I'd stood in in uh, December the 10th, I believe it was, or certainly um, maybe October the 10th. It was late uh, 1999 um, uh, with my friend and I'd been looking at this sign and it was about um, I guess somewhere between A5 and A, A4 and uh, my colleague um, in I, I, I'd set up a, a, a theatre company with him and we'd gone to see some West End movies but we happened to be waiting to go up to the observation deck on the South Tower and I was in the restaurant and I was looking at this sign and it was saying um, uh, something. Which I, I just couldn't understand how they could know it. And it, my friend said, you know, what are you so fascinated with? And I said, well, there's this sign here. And it's saying that this building is designed to withstand the direct impact of a passenger liner. And I thought, how can they know that? Well, a long time since I found out that it was designed to withstand a direct impact of the largest airliner um, that was around at the time of its design, and which I b believe was in the late 60s. Um, but anyway, um, I thought that was fascinating. And, and, and to be honest, for most of the time I was waiting in the cafeteria, I was looking at that sign and pondering it. I was less interested about looking out the window. <laughs> um, so I went up to the top of the tower and I saw my views and, and everything, and uh, it was a big moment. And I, I also had the pleasure of going across to... Uh, the Statue of Liberty and climbing up into the crown and from the crown uh, where the crown spikes come out there's windows in between those um, spikes on its on its uh, crown and you look out of there and of course you can see Lower Manhattan and uh, the Twin Towers and so those are the two visceral memories for me for um, the actual buildings themselves and also going up into the elevators and these very fast elevators you went you had to switch from some elevators to another one to go up into the high part of the building and and then i'm seeing this thing on on the day and it was kind of like it was like a pre-packaged answer they, they they already knew unbelievably quickly um supposedly who had done it and um you know, obviously they, they were saying it was done with planes. Uh, and, uh, you know, the whole thing with the towers coming down uh, was bizarre. But later in the, in, in the day, there was, there was something that stuck in my memory and it was seeing these cars. And these cars, they had bizarre to me damage to them because they had like windows on them that were kind of like melted and like fallen over. And to me, that seemed really odd. And, and the reason was is because my parents had a caravan site and uh, we used to have all kinds of people uh, on the caravan site. And sometimes they would buy these old bangers and they'd decide to leave them there when they, they left the caravan site because they didn't work. They couldn't drive them off and they just kind of like dumped them on us. And 
we didn't have a forwarding address and we weren't going to forward them their broken car anyway. So sometimes they would work into like a couple of gears and we'd drive them around the, the fields and have a bit of fun in them. And then my father was pretty liberal. He, he would let us um, kind of do what we wanted with them. So a couple of times we threw petrol bombs through the windows to see how they'd burn. Some, mostly we burned them, to be fair. Mostly it was burning. And so I have seen uh, petrol and diesel and as much as we could throw at it uh burning of cars and i never saw this behavior of these weird kind of like jellyfied bits of metal falling over and that really really stuck in my mind but i started my journey with ponds and fleischmann in 1989 i was uh, obsessed with science and and i i looked at um at uh uh you know that that revelation is something absolutely amazing because I was completely into alternative energy. I, in fact, I completely bought the, the the story about global warming and all that kind of nonsense. Um, you know, and I, I in fact until probably about four years ago, I was still completely bought into that narrative. Um, and I, I saw this, and then I saw. I was quite aware, having read New Scientist cover to cover for the best part of a decade, that things get announced and they they find out that they didn't really find out that it was a real thing and it kind of gets retracted. And so I'd seen that over and over and over again in a cycle. And so when there was this kind of like six month rush or whatever to, um, you know, to find out whether this was a real uh technology and there was the panel I, I remember the panel and this guy sticking up his hands and and saying uh you know who thinks this is a real science or whatever and and um effectively six of the seven or five of the six or whatever it was voted that by committee that this wasn't a science and we need to move on from it and that struck me as odd and then what happened to ponds and fleischmann afterwards it was just so shocking uh, um i thought like this is so unscientific so something else has to be going on here. And so I was I was just a little bit amused by it, but I let it sit by. And then it came to 2012 and the whole Rossi thing, uh, and um, I got back engaged with it, and I decided at my own expense to take myself to South Korea, to ICCF-17. And I met a bunch of guys there. We set up the, uh, the, the MFMP uh, and, and so forth. And, and, and really, it was to get around the fact that the, the scientists were dying. Anyone that found anything, someone would come in and throw them a bit of money and tell them to not talk and, and spin plates until they died. And then everyone wanted the Nobel Prize and they, they, they weren't willing to replicate someone else's work. So we thought if we can have an independent, independent body that is effectively testing these claims, um, then you know people that can actually have their work verified or not, actually. Um, and you know, maybe we can help move the the the, the uh, science forward. So, so that was the aim, and to do it in a, a way which you can't retract. You, you like publicly put it out there into the open space as you're doing it, and so kind of that was the idea, and that's what we did, and we replicated Francesco Cellani. Um, moving forward, about four and a half years, I have well, it's about four years at this point. I I went to visit Dr. George Eagley in. Um, uh, Budapest and I did a series of videos that are published called Stardust 1, 2 and 3 uh, they've even been translated into Germany a German thanks for the person that's done that um, and he showed me a load of pictures of what ball lightning had done, I'd seen him talk about them in a previous conference and, and I kind of thought I thought I was interested in it, it seemed like an interesting phenomenon, mostly because it, it the, the, well, the story that I was aware of that you could easily publicly find was that the there was no explanation for them and therefore they must be some kind of thing that maybe isn't real or whatever but no th this guy had taken it seriously to the tune of spending two decades looking at anecdotes and documenting them so when i went to him he showed me these effects that ball lightning could do such as bore through um thick walls and and, and the material seems to disappear and um uh cause window panes to have round holes in them and so forth and i kind of was aware um or can, i don't know when i became aware of it in in the, what i'm saying now but I, I was aware at some point that ponds and fleischmann had an incident which kind of sounded a bit like ball lightning it kind of damaged the glassware went through the table and took out a chunk of the floor 
um, uh, and that was concrete. And so this kind of, I almost equated the two at that time in terms of um, uh, the observ observables. And I thought, well, maybe ball lightning is something to do with it. And then I started kind of investigating that. But to cut a long story short, there was a sequence of events at the be beginning of um, uh, 2017, uh, which led me to... Um, I was, I was asked by Mahadevan Srinivasan, who was one of the leads at Babra Atomic Research Centre, bless him, he's now passed away in recent year. Um, and he had found, observed tritium in his experiments. It also observed, observed some type of radiation that blackened uh, X-ray film. And um, he had invited me to Babra Atomic, uh, to um, MIT, uh, sorry, the, the, the IT Mumbai University, the technical university in Mumbai, to talk to some students there. And there was a kind of semi-private concern that wanted to have some insights, uh, you know, because we'd had some success and we were working with kind of like more Parkamov uh, recipes on, on, on how to do things and so forth. So um, I, I took the opportunity to go at, at uh, not their expense. I wanted to do it without them having paying any money because uh, uh, that's how uh, I would like to have done it every time. And I think it was about, I think it was 27th or something of February. I was sitting in my kitchen and I was trying to rationalize things that I'd seen in the recent months. And, and I'd started to connect with what Shoulders had been writing, which was the closest thing I could find to ball lightning at that stage in the field of Lena. And I sat down and, and of course, I, I then, because Shoulders got involved by looking at John Hutchison, um, I'm going to add in two more people. Um, so I, I, hi, hi guys. Hi, Shane. Hi, PLQ. Um, I um, was interested, uh, sorry, I, I observed um, similar effects in what John was doing uh, and, and Ken Shoulders was brought in to investigate John's work. And I sat down at the table and I thought, oh my God, uh, this, this is making holes in windows. And there's these... And, and, and this is gelifying metal. If these things are connected, this would explain that thing way, way at the back of my head that didn't make any sense. Why these cars had these little jellified kind of window frames over, which I knew couldn't happen because I had burnt cars with my brothers. You know, we knew this couldn't happen. And so I, I sat down at my kitchen table and I said, and, and, and I said, oh, I said, I hope this isn't true. I just hope this isn't true. And I typed in something like, round holes, uh, um, ground zero windows or something, or windows, round holes, 9-11, uh, ground zero, something like that. And a whole bunch of images came up. And sure enough, there were these round holes in these windows. And I thought, and I'm going to swear now, I don't like swearing, I rarely swear, but I'm going to swear because this is not going to go to YouTube, it may not even re get recorded, but anyway, I, I just put my head in my hands and I, I thought, oh, f oh, f and I said to myself, I'm going to have to change my presentation because 9-11 was done with the same technology that underpins Gold Fusion. And and I thought, you know, I, I've built up respect in the community. I built up, uh, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm only a volunteer, but um, you, you work towards uh, <laughs> not being a, a, in a position to completely humiliate yourself. But I thought, if I need to keep my honesty, which I, I want to, and my integrity, which I try to always, I have one choice. In fact, two choices. One, to walk away. Or two, to just say it. And so I had three days to rewrite my presentation. I had three days and I was traveling to India on long flights. And those, those three days were probably the most traumatic in my life um, because I, I knew that, that um, I would split the community. Uh, I might damage the the reputation of the mfmp personally I do, i'm not a tenured professor i'm not i wasn't working for a company my my 
life didn't depend on it, but, um, you know, I, I knew that it would be very difficult. And I was going literally like a bull into a china shop with several people from the, the Indian nuclear authorities, former and I believe current, uh, some people from this private company and a load of students. And I just had to say, I just had to say it because this has been weaponized. And by that time, I'd kind of already worked out that it had been weaponized probably from the 1950s to the 1960s. And in fact, I'd already concluded at that point that the building may actually have been, not concluded, but in my movie, if I was to write a movie about this, scientifically, I'd have said that the building was designed to be taken down with this technology in my movie. Like, it might not be like that, but in my movie, that's what it would be like. You know, I would know this technology and I'd, I'd have this thing ready for theatre in the future to perform some sort of whatever, some purpose. Um, <clears throat> and so that, that's essentially uh, the f- choice I faced. And, and I chose... Uh, the bad is already there. If I say that how this is done, it's not like I'm revealing anything that the evil people don't already know how to do. But look at what it shows you it can do for positive. Look at the sheer power and the energy, the, 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 what it can do. There are, there's got to be unimaginable positive ways that this technology can be used. Because there's always good and bad. You can, you can cut vegetables and make you know, wonderful food with a knife and you can kill someone. And it, it killed people. And not only that, it caused the justification to go and kill a lot more people and, uh, and basically take freedoms away. I mean, I remember carrying explosives when I was a teenager in, in my bag from, you know, Charles de Gaulle to, to, to uh, London Heathrow. No one came. I had a whole load of bangers I bought at the, at this, the, the um, what do you call it? The tobacconist. You know, you could just go and buy explosives. <laughs> And I had them in my bag. No one cared. And we, we were at a situation where, you know, if your sh- shoes stank, you had to take them off. <laughs> and it's like, and, and seriously, if someone wants to do some ill, they're going to do it. They're going to do it. Uh, and uh, all of these impositions, the, these justifications, and it's like they have this entire manual about how to monitor people around the world ready to go. The Patriot Act. It's like there's no way that document was written in, in the time it was claimed to have been written in. It's just nonsense. And so um, I, I had this thing, and I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm looking at this image, and, I, and I'm saying, uh, what, there's a name down there. Who's that? Who's that? And it's a Dr. Judy Wood. I said, who's, who's she? This is, this is February the 27th, I think. Whatever it was, it was, it was late February 2017. And down at the down the bottom, it had this Dr. Judy Wood. So I thought, I'll, I'll do a search for Dr. Judy Wood. And I came across this website, and I think Andrew had made it. Uh, I'm probably right in saying that, right, Andrew? I think the original website, yeah, uh, the, I'd helped out with that. Dr. Wood had mainly done it, but I'd, I'd actually given her the web space for that. Okay, so so I'm, I'm looking at this site, and I'm going, oh, my God. Oh, Oh no! And I'm going through it, and I'm I'm thinking, yeah, but but she hasn't worked out that this is this is Ken Shoulders, it's, it, that it's effectively kind of some type of ball lining. And then she's got a whole section on Ken Shoulders, and I said, yeah, but she doesn't know that this is this is John Hutchison. And and there it was, it, it was John Hutchison, and and she had come from a, a structural engineer's point of view. And looked at what was on occurred on the day and said, this is absolutely patently absurd. What you're looking at on the screen and what they're telling you is how it happened is just nonsense. She used to go to, I, I believe I'm right in saying, Andrew, she would go to a court case and say like a building fell down because of this reason type thing. But, well, she didn't say fell down, but uh, she didn't. No, no, she, but she's like an expert witness for structural. Oh, witness. sorry. I, I don't know if she'd been an expert witness in previous Right. Court cases. I, I don't think that was her background. No, but she, she had written like <laughs> she she published sixty papers, I think, before yeah. before doing the nine eleven stuff. Uh, you know, not not she had co-authors and stuff, but yes, she'd she'd published in in various journals yes. and engineering journals. She'd come from the engineering point of view and ended up with that. This can be explained by John Hutchison and Kenneth Shoulders 
and it also explains cold fusion. I'd come from cold fusion, and I said that 9-11 can be explained by John Hutchison and, and uh, uh, Kenneth Shoulders after four and a half years uh, uh, of working in, in trying to understand cold fusion. That is no coincidence. And I think probably a little later in the year, I learned that Stephen E. Jones, the same person that put up his hand to effectively um, uh, end the cold fusion story for Mar Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Poms in America, the same Stephen E. Jones <clears throat> was kind of wheeled out and given a forum to try and establish what had happened with um, uh, 9-11. And, and uh, you know, this is Stephen E. Jones that came up with mu and catalyzed fusion, okay? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but I think probably I haven't actually had in direct contact with Stephen E. Jones. Um, uh, and I, I'm sure he's a very nice guy and, it, you know, but some people are just doing their job and this might be just doing the job. And it was very much later that Andrew sent me a document saying, uh, sorry, an audio clip of him. I think it's him admitting that he was a contractor to the Department of Energy and to um, the Los Alamos National Laboratory. And, it, right. and, and I, I'm very good at spotting a liar from their... Um, from their body language, like like the first time anti Fauci, I saw him on on camera, and he stepped up and talked about a certain drug that you can't talk about. Um, it, it was just straight out lying on his face, and I thought, this guy's lying. This guy's lying. Why are we listening to him? And th there's one, I think it's Architects and Engineers for Truth video, and I don't know whether he's lying, but he gave the biggest tell you can give as a lie. He said, he said, and, you know, I had all these samples and I sent them out to these five independent labs. And, and some people have even suggested that I spiked the samples. Like with a massive duper smile at the end of that sentence. And it's like, seriously, you did that? Now, maybe he's not lying. Maybe he didn't spike the samples. But why even say that? Why, why even say that? And if the samples all did come from him, and he did work at Los Alamos Natural, National Laboratory, and he did say earlier in the same Architects and Engineers for Truth video that one of the only labs in the world that could have produced this is Los Alamos National Laboratory, why did not he disclose in that same Architects and Engineers for Truth video that he was a previous contractor for Los Alamos National Laboratory? Why did he not do that? Just at least to put it out there, not leave that hanging in his background, when he's saying that this is one of the only places that can produce it. And so I'll, I'll hand it over to Andrew now, um, because what, I, what I've showed you is a segue between two different instances. And there's one common, there's three common people in the story. That there is John Hutchison, Ken Shoulders, and, well, uh, and, and uh, uh, Stephen E. Jones. And Stephen E. Jones connects Cold Fusion to... Uh, uh, 9 11 alternative stories, um, and to getting rid of the theory that it was the same technology that underpins cold fusion, as proposed uh, effectively first by Dr. Judy Wood, and independently uh, by myself coming at it from the exact opposite direction. So I'll hand it over to Andrew, and he can talk about you know how he came about uh, with Stephen E. Jones. And, and we'll, we'll address the whole uh, thermite thing and the nuclear thing in my movie. Like if I was going to use science to explain all the anomalies at 9-11, I, 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 that's my movie. My movie is about science. It's about, it, uh, uh, Dr. Judy Wood was what happened and maybe these people's work explain it. Mine is, you know, uh, this is how it may have happened in my movie. If I was going to write scripts and have some actual scientific backing underneath it rather than, these weird, this weird stuff happened, but you know you just got to believe it was kerosene. You know, I'll hand it over to 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 Andrew to say you know how, how he uh, um, got into touch with um, mm. Stephen Jones. Yeah, well, that that was uh, you know initially I didn't know who Jones was, and this was at the end of uh, would have been the end of right at the end of two thousand and five because uh, you know my background, as I said, is in software development, but my degree and i don't have any advanced degrees 
you know, the same as say Bob doesn't, but my degree is, is in computer science and physics. So I do have a reasonably good knowledge of, of physics. And uh, Bob and I have had a num quite a number of conversations rather than around chemistry as well. I mean, I did chemistry A level, um, sort of the end of an uh, end of high school, as you might say in the US. So my phys physics and chemistry is pretty good. Um, and it was on that basis, really, that I started to um, look at the freefall nature of the uh, destruction of the of the buildings, which had been pointed out to me in a documentary called 9-11, The Great Illusion, which was made pretty early on, I think, and it was around about 2002, 2003. And so I'd written down the equations of motion and uh, just just recalculated what was shown in this documentary, but they'd, used, they'd expressed it differently, and I, I wanted to check it in the way that I knew from what I'd been taught. And it came out the same, that, you know, your free fall time, I think it was something like... Mm, 9.4 seconds or something i forget the exact figure that i came up with but it's a very simple calculation from the uh, v squared equals u squared plus 2s and, and then you put in the acceleration due to gravity which is 9.81 meters per second squared and um so i did that little calculation takes about a minute and uh, posted this on a physics forum and i'd, I'd ask what, what's wrong with this calculation doesn't this prove that something very weird happened to the towers and uh, that actually was posted by me sometime in 2005, and that generated a lot of responses on this physics forum, like thousands. And I think I, I, I'd looked in on this thread occasionally, and it ran to uh, ran to like 5,000 responses or something on this thread. It was something lengthy. But anyway, that, that seemed to trigger somebody somewhere because at the end of 2005, uh, there were two guys... Uh, one of whom I was familiar with, one of whom I wasn't. One was Jim Fetzer, who I'd he heard uh, on Coast to Coast talking about uh, the Kennedy assassination and various other um, conspiracy, conspiracy topics, one or two other, but mainly JFK, actually. And so I was familiar with him, actually. And uh, then to Stephen E. Jones guy, and they sent me an email saying, and it was actually Jones that sent me the email saying, oh, J Jim, please uh, invite Andrew into our group, Scholars for 9-11 Truth. Please add him as a full member, which uh, I'd already uh, got wind of this group somehow, and I'd looked at their website, and I'm thinking, why are they wanting to invite me as a full member? Because I'm not, I don't have any advanced degrees. I'm not a tenured professor, uh, and I should have been invited as an associate because I only had, you know, I work for a university, uh, but I don't have any advanced degrees. Anyway, I thought nothing of that, really. And um, it was Jones that actually invited me to join this uh, this group. And then uh, he, he pretty soon after that posted this uh, paper about thermite where he'd gone through, I think, in about 20-odd pages, where he thought that thermite had actually been used and it, it had actually cut through the girders and the building fell down. And at that point, uh, I, I thought, oh, yeah, the, well, the, he's a physicist, he's a physics professor, you know, he must know that this is basically valid. Um, and, I, and I just endorsed that at that point. Um, and, and I was printing that paper out and I was giving it to people saying, look, 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 this is a real scientist. You know, he said all these things and you should take a look at this, you know. Uh, and he, and he, he, he kind of sort of agreed at one point with the free fall, but then I think he, he became rather coy about the free fall. He wouldn't talk about it. I think he mentioned it in one version of his paper and then he took it out, which was one of the first times I became a little bit suspicious of him. But, you know, I carried on and I supported him. And then he said, oh, I'm doing this video and I want to uh, edit these two clips of what is uh, apparently a thermite reaction in the towers going on. And can anybody do this, he said, because we did at this point he'd set up a forum and all this, these uh, academics were posting on this forum and, you know, various debates ensued one of which was about the use of thermite. And um, and, I, and, and I read this and I said, oh, yeah, well, I, I know how to do video editing, you know, such as it was back then in 2006, quite rudimentary in, in some ways, but you had Windows Media Player, which allowed a very quick, uh, simple video editing. And so I did that and I sent it him in an email or sent him a download link or something, whatever I did. And he said, oh, he said thanks very much, you know. And then there was another situation because Kevin Ryan, who um, has be, became quite prominent, and he worked for um, Underwriters Laboratories, who contributed to the NIST reports. And Kevin Ryan did a presentation in 2006 
talking about uh, explosive demolition and thermite. And I actually made it, it was just an audio, though. He'd, he'd gone to a public library and recorded the audio. And I actually got his PowerPoint start slides off him. And I made it into a video and posted it for him on Google Video, which was just starting up then. So we're getting all this free video, uh, online video access then back in 2006. And um, so I got involved with that scholars group and I corresponded with quite a few people. But then anyway, I think it was like August 2006. And uh, Dr. Judy Wood and Dr. Morgan Reynolds published this paper, published this paper. And they were saying, well, actually, uh, we have seen different effects in the evidence, some important effects. And uh, we think there's some type of energy discharge going on somehow and and morgan reynolds was also arguing that um the damage to the towers wasn't consistent with the crash of a boeing plane and he was really hammered for that saying what are you saying there were no planes and he, he wasn't exactly saying that and i was thinking wow this is interesting i, I didn't i certainly didn't react saying you know the, i thought well, these are top top people you know they, there must be there's something that's definitely worth looking at here and that's what i did so i read the paper and uh, I found that when I read it, read through it, my name was mentioned in it. And um, he, 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 the, uh, Morgan Reynolds had mentioned that um, he'd written to Jones and asked Jones, who had uh, put out this clip of the thermite reaction and edited into this video. And he told he told Morgan Reynolds that I'd done it. And that's what he put in his paper. So I thought, oh, that's a bit weird. Why would anybody want to know? you know, what, what I'd done, you know, some guy with a website sort of thing. And um, so I wrote to Morgan Rell, said, oh, hello, Morgan, you know, um, that, yeah, it was me that did it. You know, I, I was just doing it because it was a favour, really. I didn't really think anything of it. And he wrote back and said, oh, that's fine, thanks. You know, he didn't criticise me, he didn't say, you idiot, you know. But actually, he should have said that because I was a bit of an idiot, really. Um, but that's the whole point. That That's what I, that, that's what I learned from that. And um, I learned quite quickly that I'd been used. I'd been used to put out false information. I'd been used to, um, you know, in an effort within, within a group of supposed academics to put out disinformation. And it was disinformation about something that was extremely important. Uh, and so it was over the period of about the next sort of six to nine months, I think, that I gradually... I think I think following this exchange with Morgan Reynolds, I ended up on some. Yeah, I think he copied me on on some email list, and uh, I think that was when I first heard of Dr. G. Wood and started listening to what she was saying. And they they were exchanging emails, and she then in November 2006, this Fetzer guy who I assumed was on the level, he uh, actually switched sides and originally had criticised Wood and said that what she was talking about this energy weapon was. Just, it was unproven, you know, it was silly, it was discrediting the truth movement, blah, blah, blah. But then in November, he switched and he, he interviewed her on his this podcast program thing that he had. And he just let her speak and she laid it all out, you know, what she'd found up to that point. And um, there, there's still this recording available. I've still got it on my website. Um, but the, the, the one of the most prominent bits in this interview from 2006, I think it might have even been November the 11th, actually, uh, 2006, an, an auspicious day. And uh, she's, Fetz is asking her where she thinks this weapon, whatever it was, that was used, because she, she had by this point started talking about a directed energy weapon by November uh, 2006. And he said, well, okay, then, Dr. Judy, where, where is this weapon? And she says, well, I, he said, is it on the ground? And, and she says, no, I, I think... I think it might be orbital, and that's basically what she said. You can hear her say this. She thought it might be orbital. She didn't know that. It was a guess. She was still doing research, and, and this idea had, had come from the evidence that there were these circular holes in the buildings, 24 foot wide, and they looked to have been drilled down into the building. And that was, the, I think, the main bit of evidence which made her suggest that this thing would be uh, possibly possibly be orbital now if you go back and listen to that recording uh fetzer he, he, he like almost has an orgasm when she says this and it's a really kind of severe reaction and i think the reason for this was that uh, they wanted to line up a, a straw man attack on this and accuse her of talking about laser beams from outer space and she never actually said that what she actually said was 
it was probably some type of uh, system that was developed in secret as part of the SDI program, the, the Strategic Defense Initiative, which, of course, was called colloquially uh, by people in who were criticizing Reagan, the Star Wars program. It, that was the n name that the media gave to it. But it, the actual government title of it was the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI. And um, so the doctor would have then got this posting on her website talking about the Star Wars beam weapon. And that wasn't, again, it wasn't really her title. That was suggested to her by somebody called Frank Ferguson. And then this whole, you know, deluge of, of criticism was falling on Dr. Wood for, talk, for talking about space beams and Star Wars beams and all this thing. But it was a combination of somewhat misquoted things that, she, that, 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 that was used against her. And... And they didn't actually look at the evidence and they didn't look at the reason why she had actually said this, you know, and she then then she started to show more pictures of toasted cars and they tried to debunk those. Um, and, and then really then the scholars group, the 9-11 scholars group under Jones and Fetzer, they became an outfit whose main objective was to debunk not to support and find out and, and help Dr. Judy Wood, it was then to debunk her research. So she and Mo Morgan Reynolds, they left that group, and I kind of was um, riding on their coattails, you might you might say, and I was writing articles, and uh, I, that's what became my first book, 9-11, Finding the Truth, which is a free download from Check the Evidence. Uh, and I wrote all of that, a lot of that goings on, I wrote all a lot of that up in that book because I knew that something important was going on and that what Dr. Wood and Dr. Reynolds was doing was very, very important. Um, and, um, you know, that progressed really through 2006 and 2007. And it was late 2007, in other words, about a year after I'd first corresponded with Dr. Wood, that uh, she she somebody had sent her John Hutchinson's blog and saying well, the, the, he's talking about energy effects and he, maybe this will be useful to you and and this she had actually come across this in an email you know somebody had sent it to her like months earlier and she hadn't just hadn't looked at it so she went and looked at it and by the time she looked at it she'd already collected a lot of images from the 9/11 image archive you know various sources online by then. And then she saw the, the the parallel between these effects, you know, the, the twisted beams and the beams that John Hudson had twisted or the, the bars and the toasted cars. Uh, and then some of the effects on metal that John Hudson has seen. And of course, then next thing was probably the levitation, where she'd seen evidence of levitation. Um, and that's been seen in John Hudson's ex experiments. So over a period of perhaps a, a couple of months, she lined all of this up and um, she got quite a lot of... Uh, you know, uh, images really. And I said, well, I think you need a summary of this because I think you, you're actually putting a lot of stuff out there. And I think it's going to be hard for people to uh, kind of digest. So I actually did, did a one page summary and I just literally got a Hudson image, put that on the left hand column of the table and a 9-11 image and put it in the right hand column of the table, maybe the other way around. And I put that on to, and said, look, why don't you have that as your introductory page? You know, and it was all her work. I, all I'd done was just like summarize it into a short, like one page thing, you know, so you could see the parallels. And it was it was, it was obvious to a child that it was the same thing. And uh, once we'd done that and she'd done that and I'd sort of just given her that little bit of feedback and, you know, organizational input, really, you might say, she rang up Fetzer. And she, we, we put this on the website and she said, right, I'm going to, I'm going to put this out there now. And the first person she contacted was Fetzer. And she says, oh, Jim, because he'd been actually doing interviews with her as she was putting this stuff out. And he was saying, oh, the Judy, this is marvelous. You know, this is really good stuff. And the stuff you've got here is just brilliant, you know, blah, 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 giving her strokes all the time. And um, then she rang him up with this uh, Hudson Effect page. I said, oh, I've got something new to show you, Jim. This is what I've been working on for the last you know, week or two. And uh, rings, rings him up. He says, I'm just going to go down to my basement and get a cup of coffee so I can study this with you. And he went down to the basement and she sent him the link. He opens the page and he looks at it and he says, I've just got to make a phone call. And, you know, cuts her off. Now, bear in mind that uh, I was told sometime after this 
by Dr. Wood that she had been invited by Fetzer to go to an event at, that um, the National Press Conference Club in January 2007. So this is several months before she stumbled on the Hudson blog or, or studied it. And uh, she was asked a question by Fetzer at that event in January 2007. Was 9-11 a cold fusion event? He asked Dr. Wood. In two thousand, and she, what, cold fusion. What, what's that? She, I don't. She hardly even knew at that point what cold fusion was. But um, I think that's. I have to interject. Sometimes people that have the knowledge can't help but accidentally reveal it. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you know, and I think it was then. Of course, later. I think it was after. Sometime during the summer of 2000, I've, I've skipped over a bit. That's when we discovered what you were saying earlier on, Bob, about Stephen E. Jones being involved in cold fusion research. And I think uh, it was a, a lady called Rosalie Grable that told us that, because she and I was involved with that on our email list. Now, Rosalie Grable went under the pseudonym of Web Fairy. She passed away, I think, about four years ago, sadly. Uh, she was a, quite a, an, an oddball character, but certainly uh, had some very useful input into the discussions that we were having around then. And I think it was, came through her that Jones had been involved in cold fusion. And of course, it wasn't, there was no secret. Um, but she, I think it was she that sent us this uh, heavy Watergate documentary about Pons and Fleischmann that was published in the year 2000. And that's got some pretty good interviews. And, it, and it's very critical of Jones in that documentary, saying that, you know, he, he was a shameless opportunist and he was he was out to actually stop uh, Pons and Fleischmann patenting their process. And that was that was Jones's initial objective, apparently, um, because he claimed that his, his process, would, he'd developed his process before them, even though it's a very different process. I think that was the rationale behind him trying to block their patent. So when that came out, really, in, in sort of mid-2007, I thought, this Jones guy's dodgy. And I asked him th th at that point, and I was corresponding with Dr. Wood, and I got a bit nervous because I didn't know, I'd, I'd never really been up against an academic in this way before. And I, I said, well, what shall I ask him? So he'd asked me a question, Jones, and the son says, well, she's, Dr. Wood said, well, why don't you ask him when thermite has ever been used to demolish a building? You know, uh, and I asked him a couple of things like that, and I just literally got no response back from him. You know, and he didn't, he couldn't really criticize anything that Dr. Judy Wood had put on the table. He couldn't say where it was wrong. You know, all he could do was say that sh she had attacked him and that she brought the 9 11 truth movement into disrepute by entertaining the idea that no planes crashed into the towers. And that, of course, wasn't really Dr. Wood's bag particularly. It was, it, although she does mention it in the Word of the Towers Go book, she has a little bit on that in, I think, chapter three in that book. Uh, but it was Morgan Reynolds that was going after the plane stories and, and talking about the lack of plane debris and this sort of thing. So I thought that was an unfair criticism of, of Dr. Wood. Um, and it seemed that, uh, again, Jones was just wanted to go after Wood. He wasn't interested in whether he was right or wrong about his thermite. He just wanted to go after her. And that's then what happened. Um, you know, so I've, I've written all that up at great length, but I think that's, that's probably a fairly full explanation of how I ended up getting involved. And it was kind of a weird sort of involvement, as I say, because I wasn't a tenured professor. I hadn't written any scientific papers. Jones, for example, suggested that if I wanted to promote the, the, the beam hypothesis or whatever name he gave to it, I should write a scientific paper. That, and I actually got that in an email from him at some point said, oh, well, if you want to support this theory, you should submit it to the Journal of 9-11 Studies, which was this website set up. Uh, but if you think of it, Journal of 9-11 Studies, get the initials of that. It's actually Jones, you know, so that was quite, quite odd. Uh, and he, he said I should write a scientific paper with some other people. But I'd never done this. I'd never written a scientific paper. And indeed, it was it was silly of him to suggest that because he knew I didn't have a uh, an advanced degree. So I wouldn't have been able to get that published in a peer-reviewed journal anyway because I wasn't writing within my area of expertise and I didn't have any advanced degrees. So that was a weird response from him as well. Um, but he, he clearly wasn't interested in actually working with Dr. Judy Wood to develop, you know, the work more and find the commonality, probably, but most likely, and almost certainly, I would say, because he knew, he knew what happened to the towers, and he was briefed on what he needed to 
direct attention away from. So his thermite theory, his paper, was a, just a total diversion away from the energy effects, and they wanted to, to corral people into this idea of conventional explosives or some um, combination of explosives uh, and thermite to actually do the the main destruction. You know, and and uh, I wrote that up at some length as well, um, and and that that what I've said there became even clearer at a later date that that's what he was doing. You know, he wasn't, he didn't want to know, he wouldn't want to talk about what actually happened to the towers. He wanted to cover that up. That became abundantly clear um, by, by pretty much mid, late uh, end of 2007, that sort of time frame. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, is everyone still able to hear us? Uh, um, do a thumbs up if you can. Uh, I'm going to actually play a, a video done by a third party because I think it's, it's a good introduction to uh, the kind of premise behind the whole thermite argument. What are they doing there? <laughs> how did they get molten? How did they get iron? And how did they get spherical? And then we looked a little further at the dust and I noticed there's also another type of particle in there. And this is what I call a red gray chip. And it basically points to the fact that uh, they have flakes of unexploded nanothermite in the dust. This uh, pyrotechnic explosive material should not be in the World Trade Center dust. Steve didn't know what he was looking for when he first started looking through the dust. And we didn't know what we were looking for. We didn't know what we would find. You know, we're, we're doing this on a shoestring. And, and I mean, we're being supported exclusively by private individuals. We did what we could with what we had. It's sort of, you know, looking for a needle in a haystack almost. They found flakes, they, we, uh, Stephen Jones, who was quoted on that video you saw earlier. Stephen Jones and a number of others that are, uh, he's a physicist, and then Niels Heritz, a chemist from Denmark. Very sophisticated, very complicated. And there's a bunch of these guys who collaborated they studied this stuff for 18 months. They used electron microscopes. They used uh, all sorts of different ways of analyzing this. They studied this stuff for 18 months. You know, we're, we're doing this on a shoestring, and we did what we could with what we had. He sent a sample from this 40-pound chunk of previously molten metal from one of those meteorites. It has small amounts of aluminum, sulfur, and potassium and manganese and fluorine in abundance. All right, well, uh, bas basically what they're talking about here is uh, you've got um, Stephen E. Jones, and he's talking about um, this nanothermite, which is claimed here. And you can see these spheres, and uh, there's some powder that someone's extracted that was working with him, and they did some, this is someone else that's gone to a monument, which is part of the Twin Towers, and they've extracted some dust, and then they apply a magnet to it, and they find these magnetic-type spheres on there. And so that's basically the argument. But if you go back to the beginning of the video, um, they do some analysis, and they find, and I want you to note these elements. Notice there's aluminium and iron in this, and in, there was aluminium and iron in the building. Uh, obviously mm -hmm. a lot of uh, silicon, uh, but silicon is also found in iron and sometimes it's found in aluminium. They've got sulfur, potassium and calcium and then manganese. And they think that this is something special about these particular uh, uh, these spheres that are found uh, when they do the analysis. And I think there's maybe another an analysis somewhere back here right at the beginning. Yeah, so just to, just to describe this a little bit, Bob, uh, what Jones was, was doing, he was going through various stages, and then, as you say, as I, think, as I think you're referring to here, what they claimed, they came up with this paper where they said they discovered these iron-rich microspheres and these um, there's various bits that came out, and I can't remember the exact order. Iron-rich microspheres was one, unreacted thermite was another, red chips was another, and, and the, I can't remember whether these came out in three separate papers they published on their Jones website or the Journal of Nine Land Studies, or whether it was one paper or two or what it was. But from that, yes, they had this chemical analysis of some dust, 
and I think they compared it, as you say, to some other dust, which had, you know, one had come from a sample, I think, by Janet McKinley, who grabbed a sample of dust off her windowsill because she lived, you know, a block down from the World Trade Center or something. But there were, there, again, you know, scientifically speaking, this, this, this didn't have a, they had an un, unknown um, uh, you know, chain of custody and uh, it wasn't it wasn't a pure sample necessarily. So the, some people were saying, well, this invalidates your paper because we don't really know where this just came from. You know, uh, it could be anything, you know. And um, so so that, that cast doubt on some aspects of this. But I think nevertheless, what they were doing was they were, they were using this to say, oh, yeah, this is all evidence of thermite or nanothermite or thermate. Um, but what I think you're pointing out here is very important because if we accept that these these um, dust samples really did come from the World Trade Center, uh, which we can't be sure of, but um, uh, I think there are certain indications that they wouldn't have told you about, which would suggest that it is, which, again, is I think what you're talking about is these isotopic ratios and stuff like no, that. It's, it's elemental. Okay. Um, so, so firstly, they say there's calcium in all of these samples. Now, Lena produces a lot of calcium. Uh, the, the, in fact, right. it fissions and fusions to calcium. Uh, Lena also produces a lot of lead. And uh, you observed uh, in many, the people who analyzed the, the uh, uh, ash found a lot of lead in there. And I'll talk to that a little bit later. Um, obviously, you're going to find iron in a, uh, a iron core building, and you're obviously going to find a lot of uh, aluminium uh, when you've got an aluminium clad building. And obviously, you're going to find uh, quite a bit of silicon. It's uh, uh, other than oxygen, it's the most abundant element in the crust. But also, there's a lot of silicon dioxide in the glass in the building, which basically disappeared. Uh, sul sulfur is interesting, and I'll deal with that in a minute. But also, you've got magnesium here. But they're saying that this is an un unusual sort of uh, combination, and I flatly disagree. Uh, firstly, these are the things that can all be synthesized preferentially by a Lena process, which I believe is a coherent nuclear trans uh, transmutation process. Um, but 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 secondly, uh, the vast majority of them were in the ash anyway, and they're basically saying that these spheres are some sort of tell of the process. I actually believe that is true, uh, but I don't believe it's what they're saying. And no. as, I've or, as I've already said, uh, because uh, Stephen E. Jones did not disclose that he was a contractor for the very same organization that he claimed would be one of the only places in the world that you could make nanothermite, and did his dupe smile at the end of being the source for the samples that were sent out to the independent labs. I mean, it doesn't matter whether the in labs are independent, if it all comes from the same source. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so what Jones was doing, I mean, you, you know, these, these iron-rich spheres may have been real, but he was claiming they were evidence of a thermite reaction, whereby, you know, I think what you're going to say is, no, that, that's not true at all. They're evidence of something else. Well, so no, what, Jones I'll, what I'll say is in my movie, there's a scientific process that I could use to, as a mm. basis to explain uh, um, these uh, these iron rich spheres. So, can, can people see me now and, and not? Really yes, I can see you. Okay, all right, good. So, I'm going to kill that um, video now um, and we'll go hopefully to uh, some presentation slides. Concrete has calcium too. Yes, it's absolutely. It's like I say, it's in the building. <laughs> Lots of it is in the building. <laughs> My movie, uh, 20 years on, and uh, you'll see what the things are in the background. But um, in my movie, um, I, I imagine that I'm the person that's trying to uh, give the scientific underpinnings for this fantasy story, this fantasy story where uh, something happened that brought down some buildings. And uh, there's three hypothesis, hypothesis I think uh, are generally agreed on that people discuss um, and are allowed to be discussed, and that is planes, nukes, or thermite. And there is this alternative one, that it is some form of type of cold fusion type technology. And that is the only one I understand it, the only alternative theory to the government theory that is permit not permitted to be on Wikipedia. Am I right in saying that, um, Andrew? Well, I mean, you'll, you'll find the odd mention of the uh, direct energy weapons and 9-11 on Wikipedia, but they're probably embedded in other things. Uh, Stephen E. Jones has his own Wikipedia page, and I, I haven't looked at that recently, but I'm sure someone here listening could go and check and see if it 
mentions his, you know, discussion of thermite, which he probably does. Um, certainly, if you try and create a page on Wikipedia about Dr. Wood, it, it, it won't last more than 24 hours. It will get deleted. Yeah, I was actually told that um, some guy repeatedly tried to do that, and then he reached out to Wikipedia, and they said that, that they had an instruction to take these pages down. That was right, to Dr. yeah, Wood. yeah, yeah. That was, uh, that was Abraham Hafiz Rodriguez that did that, or he was right. one of the people that did it anyway. I think he actually had a recording of the person that was telling him we've yeah we've got some messages that we did all the message history didn't get saved apparently but right, right. i've got a bit of that on check the evidence yeah a little bit right okay so that that is interesting that, that mm. they're quite willing to allow the uh the plane theory of course yes mm. well, you? um and they're quite willing to allow the nukes theory theory and the thermite theory but uh not the cold fusion theory um so so sometimes um, the, the the one that is the true theory is the one that won't is not allowed to be discussed, <laughs> in, in my view. Uh, and so um, I think that that tells you something. Uh, but we're going to address the planes theory. Uh, I think first in my movie, um, scientifically, the planes theory doesn't add up, and um, so I wouldn't have used that as my narrative, uh, really, because. Um, it, 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 at Shanksville, uh, there was little sign of a plane. Uh, at uh, the Pentagon, there was no sign of the plane's wings in, impacting the building at all. There was just a round hole to begin with. And there was no sign of any damage to the lawn in the front of the Pentagon. Uh, and there was uh, this round hole until the building collapsed from the fire. But I think there was General, is it John Stubblebine or something? There's, uh, He's sadly deceased. Uh, Albert Stubblebine, yeah. Albert Stubblebine, that's... Yeah, he, he promoted the thermite stuff, yeah. Yeah, but he promoted the, promoted the thermal bite. But, but um, Stubblebine was an expert, in, as I understand it, in satellite imagery and working out what was going on. And he uh, looked at the photo looking into the building and he says, well, I don't see anything to do with the plane in there, but I do see the turbine for a... Um, uh, a uh, uh, a cruise missile um, uh, turbine, and you know, so that that's that's you know that's his story. I don't know whether that is true. I haven't examined that picture, but uh, I do have a I did have a girlfriend once um, for a number of years or a year and a bit who actually worked at Boeing and uh, was the head of the repairs department, and uh, she told me that uh, you know when a plane comes in and it needs to be looked over for maintenance they have literally thousands if not tens of thousands of serial numbered parts on each plane and when they take a part off they put a, a, a replacement part on they'll have a log of the part that comes off and the serial number of the part that goes on and to the best of my knowledge i've not seen any data for all of the serial numbered parts that they found from all these planes from these four different sites um, there's that but th there was one clear thing that was apparently found and that was um, an engine and the but the some people who are sleuths looked at the engine and said well you know we know what engine was on the, those two planes that supposedly went into the buildings um, and it wasn't the engine that has got a photograph of being in lower Manhattan because that has the wrong kind of vents or turbine blades or something on it which makes it not the right engine so for, bizarrely, there's no engine from the planes that went into the building, but there's an engine that for a, from a plane that didn't go into the buildings somewhere in New York after the planes hit. And so that's it's all a bit weird. But from my point of view, um, my father gave me a flamethrower when I was about 12 or 13. Uh, it was a World War II thing. And he said bizarrely that it's full of kerosene. Can you go around the field and burn the weeds around the fence? And the fence was like wooden posts and, a, you know, barbed wire, you know, standard type of barbed wire. And the weeds are just dry cellulose. And the thing that stuck out for me there is I was able to throw these 10 foot flames uh, uh, into these uh, uh, cellulose weeds and they would burn you know very very quickly to dry uh, but the the, the uh, iron on the fence wasn't doing anything you know it wasn't no, nothing was happening to it and so the idea of millions and millions of sheets of paper being all over New York uh, having had supposedly a, from a building where the, a fire brought them down 
these buildings uh, from effectively kerosene or aviation fuel. It never never sat very well with me from my own experience of using a flamethrower. So I couldn't couldn't believe that the the fuel would do it. And I think actually at the time that we first met, there'd just been the Granville fire, wasn't there, in, in, in London? Uh, is it the Granville fire? There was a, a, a fire in London in, in a, a high-rise building. Yeah, I think the, the, the Grenfell Tower, I think, was it? Grenfell I, Tower, yeah. Grenfell, I forget the exact name of it, yeah. Yeah, and so um, it was kind of like uh, that was a building that didn't fall down and, and it had a fire burning all day type thing. Uh, yeah, there, there were several others as well. There was the um, uh, tower in Madrid as well. I forget the names. I made a booklet with these in. Right. And, uh, yeah, there were, there were several that's happened over the years where we've had some serious fires. But, yeah, you know, that was a comparison that was drawn. And then there's, uh, in Dr. Judy Wood's book, she comes up with these terms like, uh, I think it is fuming. Uh, and it's how the buildings actually right. just, um, uh, they kind of like, disintegrated well, over a period of time right i mean uh, the, the, well, the exact phrase she uses during the actual destruction of the building is lathering where yeah, the, the, yeah. the yeah so there's like there's some kind of reaction going on and she she, she even used the term alka seltzer at one time as well to in, in, indicate what they actually looked like this this foaming and and, and uh, you know material uh, but obviously it's not liquid it's it, it's actually you know become a, 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 you know very yeah um a large amount of dust and, yeah, and in uh, fact and as you said that there was a witness uh, that um was at uh ground zero uh, before the second tower fell and uh he it, uh, it was on the british news this morning and he was described first he said it came down in a pile of rubble and he says no that's not right it wasn't rubble it was just this fine gray dust it was like th th there was there was no rubble it was just this dust and it, it, that kind of fits in. So, um, but the fuming didn't stop there, did it? I mean, uh, I think Judy no. Wood went back in 2007, was it? Was it? Yeah, I think she went, certainly went back. Uh, yeah, it was 2007. And I went there with her in 2008 as well. So I think she went both years. Uh, yeah. I think the, 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 the fuming persisted for a long time and they were spraying yeah. it with water, not to put a fire out. but to Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, that's right. The, if you go and look at, there's an interview uh, or a report given by the Channel 4, the well-known Channel 4 UK reporter, John Snow, when he was there, I think, in October or November 2001, massive amounts of fuming coming out of the site uh, ground this is like i don't know two three months after you know so uh but in 2007 dr wood is, you know the thing there was a little bit that she saw back then she did take some pictures i was a bit, little bit in, i thought that was a bit inconclusive because it could have just been some type of dust they were kicking up with these this digging that they were doing it did look slightly unusual but certainly the fuming went on for uh, quite a num quite a long time, and it, you couldn't you could you see you know it couldn't be what uh, it, it wasn't it couldn't be flames you know it couldn't be hot the the way that it was actually happening it was the heat was was ruled out as being the cause of this. Yeah, and so and then there's the other subject about the loss of the mass of the building, right? Mm. Right. I mean, again, that Doctor Wood's book shows from the seismic uh, response. The, the, the buildings actually seem to literally disappear because the normal way of things is when, you know, something falls down onto the, the ground, you get a wave that behaves in a certain way. There's like a recoil and, uh, you know, then, a, then another wave when more comes down and stuff. And I think that if you compare it to the kingdom, the, the, I think the seismic changes before everything settled down. It lasted about 25 seconds or something. I forget all the exact figures. But, but if you look at the seismic signature from the World Trade Center, you know, that, that actually shows that the buildings actually got lifted off the ground and the ground responded to a loss of weight rather than an increase, you know, or, or an impact rather of, of a lot of weight. So it, all, all of it supports the, the, uh, the conclusion that the buildings turned to dust in midair. All of it supports that. None of it doesn't support that. I agree. And in fact, I actually have, uh, I gave in, in my remote view um, uh, blog, I gave links to the justification video, uh, which was very well done. Um, I've got a couple of notes here from Shane. Sulfidation of the steel was the point uh, they tried to make for thermite characteristics, two oxygens. Um, we'll talk about that. Yes. 
Planes are made mostly of aluminium. Yes, David. Uh, and that gets destroyed first by Lena. Absolutely. Shane, interestingly, quite a bit of cladding on the towers remain minus uh, the steel beneath. Yeah, uh, correct on the engine and other serial numbers didn't match among many holes. Uh, one can drive a dump truck through. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. So I'm going to go through uh, some presentation here because I think there's some new things that I can add to the uh, discussion that never been discussed before. I mean, th the first one is, you know, could there be something that is direct energy weapons or uh, something that could explain the plane? So dealing with the plane story first, there's one thing that I noticed about one of the videos is there was a, the, the plane came in from the side and its nose cone came out of the other side of the building, but with a gap. Now, at the time, I was using the best money could buy DPS Edit Bay uh, video editing tool. And uh, when I later saw this, uh, I thought, well, someone's just done made a video here and they, they've um, caused this. They haven't put the mask over the full area that the plane needed to go through because the plane was, you know, <laughs> they'd done a path for it to fly along. Um, and uh, they, they'd they done the mask for the building and a little bit bigger, but that they, whoever did the video edit, um, missed the full bit length of the plane coming out the other side. And so, for, for that, for me, was just a tell. In the other videos, um, a lot of the videos look like, um, they're just black blobs and there's things popping in and out of view. Now, I do know because I pretty much used every video format at the time that was contemporary around that time, that if you go through a couple of generations with the, the different DV formats and the, the VHS formats and stuff, and you lose some quality, there, there might be some psychovisual things where the, the repetitive encoding loses some information. But what was clear on a lot of these things was that the plane looked a plain shape, but it was mostly kind of like gray uh, or black rather. And I think actually I might in saying, uh, Andrew, that some some of the testimonies at the time said that, well, it didn't really look like a passenger plane. It was kind of like didn't have any windows or something. You might be able to speak to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things I got involved with fairly early on when I, you know, I was talking earlier on about how I got involved with Dr. Wood and Dr. Reynolds. And Dr. Reynolds was looking at all the uh, witness testimonies which had been published on the New York Times website, and uh, 500 of them, which have been released under a freedom of information request. Uh, we actually, I actually downloaded all 500 of those, you know, using a like a web utility or something, rather than doing it manually. And then we searched through all the accounts, and uh, you know, we were looking for descriptions of the plane and how what people saw of the plane and what if they saw it crash and all of this. And, and then there's quite a lot of inconsistency in that. And, and some people said they saw a large plane. Some people said they saw a small plane. You know, and some people didn't say a plane at all. And several people said, well, I didn't know, even know that planes were involved in this incident until I saw, saw it on the news when I got home, you know, which is kind of weird when they were actually there, when these, certainly Flight 175, you know, was the main one. Because obviously the first one, uh, people weren't really looking at the, tent, the towers, you know, the, they were just going about their business. But the second one, of course, people had already seen um, the destruction and so forth. So they were focused on it. So, um, yeah, a lot of inconsistency over the description of Flight 175, which was the second one. And, uh, you know, many, many problems with the uh, with the accounts and the, the explanations that have been put out in the so-called uh, shame stream media, as I now call them. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, I, I, uh, David said the planes are not important. I, I agree the planes are uh they're part of the story of the official narrative. So in that respect, they, they do have value as a discussion point. But from my point of view, the, the speed at which is recorded on the videos that are published and the speed that's recorded on the radar and the locations match up. And I, and I think uh, uh, Richard D. Hall did a very good analysis of that, uh, showing that they matched up. However, um, the speed that they're flying at is too fast for an aircraft to be manipulated by an experienced pilot at that uh, altitude because the air density is something like three times what it is at the cruising altitude, but they were actually flying at their cruising altitude speed. No, they were flying at the, out the speed of a cru Tomahawk cruise missile or a cruise missile. Um, and in fact, on a couple of the, the videos, you can see something that is a silvery cylindrical thing on the underside of this kind of grey black fuselage, almost like whatever there was that there was the illusion that was tracking the same weapon 
it was kind of slightly offset just before it went into the building, such that the the, the thing that it was um, uh, masking uh, was basically out of position uh, or, you know, it had a registration error on, on that. And so um, that actually may have just been a video editing on this thing, because remember, almost everyone that saw the planes saw the planes on video. And most of the people that were there were convinced that they saw planes because that someone told them that they saw it on video. And so they thought, I get in the back of their head, they must have seen planes. But m- m- most of them would have just heard, <laughs> like that, <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> yeah, if at all. So um, I, th- I think really the, the plane story, because it, I, I think there was like um, uh, a- airline pilots for 9-11 Truth or something, and they, they, they had like all these pilots, hundreds of them that had flown for 60,000 hours, and they tried to fly one plane into the buildings square on and they none of them managed to do it and so basically if you can't get experienced pilots to do it then i don't think you could easily get uh, um people who are inexperienced to 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 hit it twice no i mean that 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 was an argument which went on for months and years and it was something it was another kind of divisive element in the scholars group that people said oh we shouldn't talk about that and you know as as um, as david said uh Doctor Wood has said the same thing that the planes are a distraction if, if we're talking about the process which destroyed the building. And it's true. But but um a lot of people obviously that's the most visible element and the kind of scariest element almost that somebody, oh, you know, could hijack these planes and crash them like this, you know. And so people need a resolution to that. Um and we, we it's something that I was reluctant to talk about because when you say to people, oh, these these planes, you know, they weren't really planes, they some people want to say they were remote controlled, but that doesn't wash because remote controlled planes have the same physics as you know human controlled planes they, they crack they would break apart in the same way and if you look at the way these cruise missile can easily hit its target square on right and, you, know, you, you and have that, something that flies like a tomahawk cruise missile it it, it, it it maneuvers it's at the speed of a tomahawk cruise missile and it hits its target like a tomahawk cruise missile and then you have something that sticks out of the bottom of some of these videos that looks like a something like a potentially a yeah yeah log. yeah it certainly it certainly you know fits more of the visual evidence than, than a boeing you know, large Boeing plane or similar plane does, you know. So, I mean, so we won't get into all of the, no. the 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 um the signals that came from the planes and the fact that they switched over at a certain time. Right, somewhere. right. You know, but again, as you mentioned, Richard D. Hall's analysis, I think, is pretty pretty spot on with his with the looking at the past and things. So, I think that 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 pretty much proves that it wasn't a, that it wasn't Boeing planes. And the totality of the evidence proves that no Boeing planes crashed into the World Trade Center, or indeed at any of the four sites. And, you know, it, it's a very tough one to talk about. And the scholars group certainly was involved in not wanting to talk about that. And that, that's why Wooden Reynolds kind of got booted out initially, uh, because they, they, they wanted to talk about the evidence that no one else wanted to talk about, you know, and um, and I think in, in summary, you know, and you're going to expand on this, I know, but both of those lines of study lead you to secret technology. That that's why the scholars yeah. group was set up to to, to to sort of keep that technology covered up, and, and essentially it is still covered up. We I think yeah. we can just prove that it exists, but we and can't. I think we're going to do that now. Because, I think so. Yeah, uh, yeah. We, we've talked about this particular thing: uh, systems and methods for generating coherent matter wave beams. Basically, this is starting with the technology that produced Tesla's death ray, and it produces coherent matter rays, uh, which which are matter wave which uh, I believe is uh, what Shoulders was doing. And in fact, the description of what they are doing is um, uh, is producing a, a discharge from a point electrode. And that's exactly what they say in their patent and passing it over a magnetic field. And that produces the coherent matter. And that, that can allow you to create matter wave projectiles and missiles, directed energy weapons, matter wave optics and cloaking. So this very same technology that can produce the directed energy weapons can produce matter wave optics and cloaking. So this is, they're admitting they can do it, um, but of course this is from, uh, it was first published in 2016, November 22nd, but it's actually I think from 2013, I think maybe 11, uh, down here, July the 4th, 2013. So, um, yeah, so basically, you, you have a technology that can do it, and it's exactly the way they describe it in their pattern is 
a point electrode and, 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 and a discharge and then across a magnetic field. And effectively that is Ken Shoulder's patent, but also it's, it's uh, Tesla's death ray. On the next patent here, uh, this is US Navy patent and, and this would account for the dustification, but actually in these high frequency gravitational wave generator, in, a little bit earlier in the patent to the bit that I'm just gonna talk about here, they actually describe that a discharge uh, a, across a magnetic field will lead to uh, um, a high, the production of a high frequency gravitational wave generator. So it's the same thing. <laughs> so these two patterns are really talking about a family of the same technology. This one can produce your directed energy wave, wave, uh, weapons and your cloaking. And this one can literally says it right here. Imagine a plurality of high frequency gravitational wave devices, a minimum of four modules aligned around a planetary body or planetoid asteroid comet along a planar axis for cardinal points. The emitted HFGW high frequency gravitational waves would impinge on each other such as a manner to severely disrupt the vacuum energy state at, uh, uh, at a space-time locality denoting a point of impact, collision of gravitons with gravitons, yeah, whatever. At this disruption point, energy would be amplified to such a high degree as to generate a space-time curvature singularity leading to total destruction of the planetary body, right? So this is the United States, uh, United States Navy saying that they can use something which is essentially the same as a Ken Shoulders uh, device, which is the same as the Ten Shoulders device here, which are both the same as a, a as a Tesla death ray, and they are saying they can destroy a whole planet, right? <laughs> Total destruction, right? So th the idea that you can't destroy two hundred and ten story buildings with the, with the same family of technology is absolutely laughable. You have to be stark raving mad to believe that you can't use this technology to destroy two piddly little buildings when you say, when they're claiming we can destroy an entire planet. <laughs> okay. And what's and interesting as well, I think, is, you know, I, 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 I know you've discussed this paint with me before, but I'm not sure that Dr. Wooder was aware of this payment, but she actually said... I think, and this probably came from how, how, how she studied all of this, and I think she has a pretty good idea of how it all works, but she doesn't really discuss that because that's more, you know, she feels she might be making certain assumptions, but in a, in a you know, inside her own head, she, she, and she's made various comments that you can literally split the earth into with this technology. She, she said that on a couple of interviews. So oh, yeah, she said the, that in her BEM yeah. BM conference in 2012. Right. But what, what, I'm, what I'm saying here is that th this was published first on November the 22nd, 2016. This is past any work that she did, which she's known well for, okay? And it's absolutely specifically saying we can cloak objects. And because this works at the speed of, you can track, you can easily track a tom Tomahawk cruise missile and use this to cloak objects. And this is derived, in my view, from Tesla's death ray, from work that was done in 1950s and 1960s, and is equivalent to uh, a Ken Shoulders uh, device scaled up. And this is exactly what we're looking at here with the newest Navy pattern, uh, which would account for the dustification. And again, this is published on June the 18th, 2019. There's no way that she could have known this. But I think this is what's happening here is these military people are being forced to publish what they already know how to do and have known how to do for a long time, um, because the the open source field is getting close enough that other, if they don't publish it, they won't have 20 years to play around with it and sell it, right? And, uh, you know, when I first came out with the, uh, 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 my thinking in 2017, I said, they don't care about leaving weapons or selling weapons to other people in other countries because they can use this technology to turn them to dust or, or turn them to liquid or make them disappear at, at one tenth the speed of light quite readily. So it doesn't really matter. They're, 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 you're, you're selling people junk or giving them junk. They're completely irrelevant to this type of weaponry. Um, and you, you wouldn't leave a load of weapons behind somewhere if you didn't think they were a complete waste of time for how you're actually going to fight war in the future. This is how it's going to be fought in the future. And I said this in 2017. All next generation weapons will be using this. And here we are. If I was going to use science to describe how this, uh, in my movie, to underpin my movie of what went on. Not, not the movie that says it's planes, nukes or thermite, but in my movie, using science that Lockheed Martin and the US Navy are saying that they have, I would say that this is the science that is underpinning what you could have done 
to cre create the effects that you saw on the day. So I'm going to go through a couple of other things here. So um, I've already dealt with the round holes in windows. Uh, uh, we know that that is from a ball lightning like effect. Uh, the Cheetos. So this is a description that Judy Wood gives to uh, pieces of material, uh, metal, pr predominantly aluminium, that seem to glow uh, anomalously hot when they're not actually hot because you've got pieces of paper right next door that are not uh, uh, igniting. M maybe you can speak to that, Andrew, because uh, you have some context on that. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things. Um, these are some of the main uh, phenomena that you've got uh, listed there, obviously. But, uh, you know, w one of the key elements is really the lack of heat. And, uh, you know, some of the images that Dr. Wood has shown uh, in relation to the, the, the these car fires, you know, where these cars are in flames and uh, you know, a few, few couple of feet away, you've got unburned paper. So, um, you know... How is that happening? It, it, well, it's happening because these are not conventional fires. And as she said, uh, she doesn't know whether at some point these unconventional fires turn into conventional fires, you know, after a process has got to a certain point and then the material then undergoes a normal form of combustion. Um, but certainly as she's seen it, uh, the, 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 the weird fires, she called them. Um and then again, the round holes in windows, um, I certainly wondered whether they were some type of, um, uh, you know, sonic effect even uh, with, 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 you know, um, longitudinal waves of sound. But uh, I don't think that, I think I probably got the wrong end of the stick about that. And obviously what she was talking about all the types of longitudinal waves. Um, and then, of course, we immediately we, we tie in with uh, George Aguilar and the, the the ball lightning damage that he described and, and he catalogued. And I think she, she, Dr. Wood has even got one of those pictures in her book uh, from, I don't know whether it was from George Aguilar's collection originally, and she's just got it off another posting somewhere. But, yeah, so we're seeing commonality there. And these Cheetos, as she's called them, these little, little orange, little small little wisps of fire or what look like fire, but again in places where it would seem that they're not hot. Um, and again, the magnetometers, as we've mentioned. Uh, the, well, well, let's stick on the Cheetos. Because, okay. um, the, the, I think on December the, it's in, his, in her book, I think on December the, twin, uh, on the tw 12th or 11th, they're, they're pulling out from the fire um, a big sheet of what looks like aluminium and it's glowing orange hot, right? Yeah. And yeah. Um, uh, I know, because I've smelted aluminium, that it doesn't glow orange hot when it's molten. And so if you're able to pull out a sheet and it's That's glowing it. orange hot. Anyway, then, so this was observed by um, uh, John Hutchison and I believe I have observed the same yeah. effect. Me 356 uh, made stainless steel glow orange hot but it actually wasn't any hotter than it was before and he was able to switch on a certain frequency and since he was doing a Lenner experiment I believe what happens is that you, your metal gets uh, filled up with these exotic vacuum objects and when you stimulate them in a certain way or they, they're self-resonant in some way they produce uh, um, uh, when they get disrupt disrupted for instance they produce these two kilo electron volt uh, uh, um, x-rays or, or uv that excites the gas around the metal and you get something that looks uh, like it's orange hot but it's not it's not hot it's just glowing and it looks hot from a distance a bit like a cold cathode does in a you know a, a light bulb um, and, but right. you have some context with Stephen E. jones trying to defend the cheetos don't you <laughs> Well, well, this is it. I and mean, this is one of the things I, I should have mentioned earlier on, really, and why, you know, why they needed the thermite theory. There were kind of two reasons for that. One was to, as a way of explaining the destruction. And, of course, you can explain the destruction by saying bombs in the building, which kind of was a precursor to thermite. But what they needed the thermite for was to explain the glowing. And Jones actually then got into an argument with Dr. Wood about, and he made this, Jones made this statement related to what you just said, that, um, you know, that, that um, molten aluminium would be silvery in at all temperatures in daylight conditions. In other words, if you, however hot the aluminium got, if you observed it in daylight conditions, it would, it would always have a silvery appearance. And uh, so therefore, this meant, you know, according to Jones, that this orange material 
uh, that was seen. You know, it couldn't it couldn't have been aluminium, right? But uh, Doctor Wood argued that well, it could have been aluminium if it had been heated up enough. Uh, and so the point was that if it had been heated up enough to glow, then you wouldn't have had, you know, unburned paper next to it because that would immediately you know, spontaneously combust if the aluminium was at like uh, 1500 degrees centigrade, you know, because it would radiate so much heat at that temperature that paper nearby would catch fire. So it's quite, it gets a little bit complicated there, but Jones needed to protect this idea that the molten metal was proved because of these you know what were things like cheetos and these other orangey uh, glowing things he, jones was always claiming that, that that was evidence of the thermite reaction it was very hot and that heat lasted so, such a long time and it was all thermite and uh, when dr wood pointed out well if you've got all this lake of molten metal you know, uh, beneath this actual flood flood caused by the fire hoses, why haven't you got any steam explosions? You know, so we, she went through all of this. She, and she was collecting loads and loads of evidence that Jones was wrong, and he couldn't really argue with it. So eventually he had to sort of back off and just and just change his approach, which is what he did. So what I'm showing here is from uh, Judy's book, and you can see that she's mm. zoomed into this photo, and there's some glowing, ye yellow-orange glowing aluminium cladding, cladding, and right next to it is some paper, which is just not igniting. And this is what I was talking about. This is the yeah. sort of normal uh, table uh, temperatures that you would expect. And this is this Black piece body of radiation. Uh, yeah. uh, metal that's being pulled out of the ground uh, on uh, whenever it was, a number of days after 9-11. Uh, um, and uh, the, there's this close up there. So I think the, the, the Cheetos are what were, were probably the, one of the most easy things to explain uh, based on this technology. So, um, you know, it, it, you know, in my movie, the Cheetos would be explained as a, a as a overcharged piece of aluminium, for instance, uh, based on the technology that is uh, 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 actually being made public in these two patents. And uh, that um, uh, it's just it's just as it's discharging and, and it takes a long time to discharge when something's uh, overexposed. I think in Savatomova and uh, in um, uh, uh, some of the some of the Portland University, I think it was uh, John Dash's work. I think that they, they had um, material that took a very long time to settle down. And uh, I think we, we, we have observed now these plasmoids lasting for months and possibly I've got another micro session, microscope session on Monday. I think we're going to see extremely clear plasmoids that are right there on the metal uh, 11 months after the experiment. So, you know, this, this fits and um, they, they observed it continuing to transmute the material in, in Sabat, Sabatamova's work. Um, so, Yes, Shane, that, yeah, that's good what you're saying there. Right, so uh, the magnetometers in Alaska. So um, uh, this, I think, is probably one of the most easy ones to explain, and I'm going to do it by quickly going to the next slide. Um, so effectively, what I'm saying, and I will argue, is that what you're seeing here is the central core of, uh, uh, or rather the spin field around a, a, a monopole, uh, and uh, this is the ejector. So we've got our monopoles, and you have to remember, you, you have to consider one of these being upside down. And so the, the spin field is in in the central core here. So uh, the actual field of the effect is much larger, uh, and uh, you know it's throwing the stuff up into the sky. So I think it's probably a north monopole uh, rather than so. So the north. This when I say north monopole, this is a south monopole. So uh, it has a strong south pole. But a, a north monopole kicks stuff up out of it. But it's the same shape, it, but it'd be the other way up. And so um, as, as the monopole is working its way down, stuff is spinning around. It's, it's, it's going into the core and it's being basically turned to uh, nanoparticles. That gets thrown up into the sky. Some, some, much of it gets converted to gases. Um, and so the, the matter is converted to gases and it just eats its way through the building. And, and one of the one of the uh, calculations, I think someone said that, that some of the uh, um, wheat checks uh, or, or um, what do you, what do we call them in the UK? The, the shreddies. shreddies. Yeah. Breakfast some cereal. of the shreddies that are coming out, they're coming out something like 70 miles an hour. If you look at the photo photography. And I think what's happening is, is that there. Uh, this is the, um, the if I make this turn around and maybe I can. Uh, maybe it's here. If I make this pause, maybe I can get it to pause or the other way up. 
if, it, if you can imagine this is maybe okay so this is going going down to the building it's chucking the material up but on the top of, of the monopole it throws things out to the side and so i believe that that would be uh, somewhere in here things are being thrown out to the side but they then get sucked up and back in again as it goes down into the ground uh, because it's a, a, a coherent electronic structure, when it's gone into the ground, uh, it then dissipates into the ground. So it can only burrow so far into the ground. And all you'll see is the core. And I've talked about the core before, produces a, a yin-yang type structure that's observed 70 meters below ground. OK, so um, I've got one of the iron-rich spheres here, which apparently in the USGS outdoor samples and the RJ Lee samples. In the USGS outdoor samples, these iron spheres uh, were about 0.2 to 1.3% of the dust samples. And I think in the RJ Lee samples, there were 5.87% of the samples. But you find these, and I've shown this in, in, in uh, the impact zone of a ball lightning in Stalin. Uh, we produced it in our reactor. Uh, several other people produced it, but in the coherent nodes of a ultrasonic tank, I believe that they have been produced as well. Um, the other thing is that they produce these paisleys. Uh, there's a paisley here on, uh, I don't know whether you can see it, but on the Hutchison effect sample, this is the one that Alec Pizarro uh, picked up. And this is the, the piece that was displaced by his thumb, uh, which was pushing into the other side of this. But you can see this paisley. And this is on the lion wire. And underneath the copper oxide, there are these paisleys along, along the wire. And uh, it's it's this kind of uh, new form of electrical current that, that is carrying along, but it also transports the material. Uh, and so you, you have these pays, paisleys here. So I, I think that these are, you know, other things I don't, I, you know, in my movie, w whether this is factual or not, uh, this is one way that I would describe the underpinning of science, the iron rich um, magnetic crenellated spheres that we can create in a coherent matter ball lightning produced in reactor here and that is produced in a coherent matter structure in the ultra experiments this is what's happening here now the reality is if you do melt any metal and you drop it for instance uh where where uh, one of the mfmp directors used to live in uh southern france uh, or southern central france um, they had this big tower from, I think, even the Middle Ages or something, a long time ago. But it was for producing lead shot. And what they did is they would melt, um, uh, what is it? They would melt lead in a bucket and they would pour it from the top of the tower. And as it rained down, actually raindrops are spherical and so are lead <laughs> when they're molten. And so it produced the lead shot. And, and so... But that doesn't explain the fact that you have this crenellated structure and the fact it's oxide rich. And in fact, there's there's micrometeorites that look like this that were found in Australia. And they say it's, they're 2.7 billion years old and that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was higher because they've observed a higher carbon dioxide in the, uh, um, the these micrometeorites that look like this. The reality is that this produces carbon and oxygen. <laughs> so I believe that their assumption, I think they're probably just lightning strikes that have occurred in uh, uh, in australia they've deposited these stru these structures from ball lightning in the ground and they're assuming that they're micrometeorites um uh, but it, to, it is fair to say that the similar structures can be produced by the energetic con conditions of things entering the atmosphere anyway so i i think probably um uh th this this whole structure and the loss of the mass of the building was because the monopole was consuming it it's exactly the right shape for the monopole uh, uh in terms of it produces this triangle into the point but actually the field is is uh, um well it is kind of like that and so um you know th th this in my view is is what the technology would do uh if you put it into a square building to be honest um uh and uh, so then I want to talk about um, this particular structure. OK, so these are the monopoles all over a Hutchinson sample, and this is on the Lion sample. And this is this very, very key structure. This, this uh, um, I called it a petal at the time, and I think it's probably fair to say that it is, is something like a petal. Uh, and it's extremely differently affected compared to all of the other material around it, despite having the heater wire on the, on the outside and the reactor in the center. And uh, it, th this was the first time that I really saw this structure, but it definitely, definitely was not the last. So uh, this appeared on 
um, in many places on the inside of the courts, uh, but in a much smaller way. And it has this, in my, my view, this is a, a south uh, uh, monopole because it has a white bit in the center. That means the material is being rammed into the center. So maybe I've got that wrong. Maybe it's a north monopole that was tearing the building apart. One of the other. So I've, I've, I've got a 50% chance of getting it right. <laughs> and uh, so it's sweeping material around. And the reactor itself was actually put into a biscuit tin or a tea tin. Uh, um, and this is a, a colorized X-ray that was exposed to the reactor core, not, not the actual um, quartz, but the reactor core itself. And it produced exactly the same pattern. And the interesting thing about this is that it's exactly the same as the magnetic structure, at many, many, many orders of magnitude, like several times the diameter of the earth on the sun. It has every single feature. It has this little blob over here, as we see here. It has the main eye here, the iris here, this other structure and this bit sweeping out. Now, I'll actually play a uh, GIF on him that this should be. If it's going to let me. My machine can handle it. Uh, and some of you will have seen this before. And so I've overlaid on the, both the X-ray and on the uh, other one from the inside of the course. And then I've overlaid this uh, petal shape. And so every single feature lines up. So this, these monopole structures, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're at the micron scale, uh, the centimeter scale, or at the multi-earth diameter scale, it produces exactly the same structure. And this is a, this in this instance, this is it, right the way down to this tongue. You see this tongue here? It's this where this bit is taken out and it's there. It's there. If you, if you go back, they, there's the tongue. The tongue is on the x-ray. The tongue is on the damage to the quartz. And so it's exactly the same structure. So nature will always produce this structure on every scale. doesn't matter whether I believe it, even if it's on a galaxy size scale, you can produce exactly the same structure. And so I, I had a bit of fun uh, with this one because uh, when I play this, uh, when it plays... And I talked about this because I do believe that we are dealing with an occult technology. And I believe that the reason they wanted to go into seven countries in seven years is because they had to get some people to smash up the ancient buildings and artifacts and sculptures in Afghanistan. They then had to do it in Iraq and empty the museums. They then had to do it in Palmyra in Syria. They had to go into... Uh, um, uh, the Yemen. They had to do it in the Yemen. They had to do it, uh, get certain things out of Egyptian museums. And they have to, they have to, and I will talk about this later, but the G culture, which predated, in my view, the culture of the uh, Sumerians in uh, Iraq, the G culture really has some of the most important artifacts and they're still discovering them, which are absolutely 100% detailing how this technology works. OK, and so uh, that is one of the reveals that I have for this presentation here tonight. Um, but it's so amazing. Now, uh, if you actually want to know what the, the Eye of Horus is meant for, the Eye of Horus is the ancient Egyptian symbol of protection and royal power from deities. This is God's power. Right. And this is one of the reasons I called it the God's Toolbox. I called it the God's, God's Toolbox long before I realized this is an exact match for the Eye of Horus, which is considered God's power. But on the next slide, it's also a symbol for like austerity and stuff like that. Uh, uh, sorry, auspicious nature, as is this symbol, which I have talked about recently. And this is an amazing, amazing demonstration of the technology. This is up to 12,000 years. It's from a Sumerian lantern. And on, the, on the, uh, this side, you have the incoherent particles that are embossed, i.e. they are closer to you on the camera. They come into the conducive and auspicious structure, which coheres the material to the center and then throws them out in a coherent and in-phase direction okay so they're incoherent and out of phase they are coherent and in phase and what more what's more is they are debossed so the, this is showing that this is above the spiral and this is in in the spiral it's absolutely breathtaking it has exactly the same structure you see on the hutchison and there is always a left and right one of these there is always a left and right eye of okay um and the one 
it takes matter away and one dumps it down. The one that took the matter away is the one that took down the buildings. It eats into the structure. It eats into the building and eats into the ground until the electron condensate dome is dissipated, which is about 70 meters underground. So if you wanted to wipe everything off the planet so that you wouldn't observe anything, all you would get is the very deep foundations of a previous culture. And you see this all over the world in the same places that you see this symbol on those <laughs> ancient cultures, sculpting, sculptures. Um, you, this is the monopole structure that forms uh, in, uh, in a reactor when you do it, and uh, it's on the top of the reactor here, it, 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 uh, sorry, on the top of the lantern. This is a thing that produces light, and as we said from the Cheetos, this technology produces light. Now, on the next slide here, this is absolutely unbelievable. This is a overhead view of ground zero. Now I am going to play you this X-ray overlaid, and I'm gonna highlight all of the ring structures and the spots and the lines. And then I'm gonna show you what happens on this uh, uh, building. Now, in my movie, this is the technology I would use to explain what you observe in this satellite or this uh, aerial photo. Here are all the key features. That, that, that is the South Tower and the North Tower. These are the holes taken out of this building. And this is this structure, which will be produced at microns, centimeters, and multiplanetary scales. OK? It's the, the sweep that you've got around here is the area that's cut out. The actual vortex right the way to the center point on the South Tower is absolutely 100% in the structure that is produced here. These holes that are chopped vertically through the building are this hole here, this hole here, this hole here, this hole here, this hole here. They are all part of this structure. This is the occult technology. Absolutely no shadow of a doubt. Every time you run this experiment of cold fusion and you do it in a way and observe the material, you will observe what is the eye of Horus that I showed you here. You will observe this structure and the cohering forces that it does. And there is nothing, nothing that can resist this technology. Nothing. It, it even comes down to the substructures and the bits of the church over here that were destroyed. Even the holes in this building line up with the main features in this structure. There's a ring here, ring here with a sub ring and a sub ring. There's this ring here, ring here. The, the, this goes into the building, uh, um, uh, the Bankers Trust building, which they eventually had to take down. And maybe this is a good time for um, uh, Andrew, Andrew to just talk a bit about the... Uh, the uh, that particular building so you can just just talk oh, about that bank. yeah yeah the bankers trust well um maybe there was you know we we've we've wondered about if that was like an error and uh, your diagram there is very interesting because some of this is i know you've discussed some of it with me before but it's quite interesting to see that overlay because i've not seen that before tonight but yes the bankers trust so there was some um a piece of material which would seem to come out from the towers and ended up in the in the in the fascia of 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 the bankers truss and it looked initially like this had torn a gash in the building um but when you study this more closely you can see it's actually a relatively small piece which has caused an enormous amount of damage to the front of the building and then you you the, the fema reported that there was no fire inside the bankers trust building um and but yet you look at it and and you see these melted beams um but again it what looks like what happened is that what this process that you're describing uh, did impinge on the bankers trust building and maybe those those uh, circles you've got there would actually um on closer examination you know, tie up quite closely with with the damage to some of the floors now initially they repaired this damage over a period of i think about 18 months or two years um and uh, where dr wood has got put, collected pictures of these repairs having been done they planned to renovate the building 
But then I think it was in 2006, there was some announcement made about there were problems with the building. And it, they, I think the official explanation that came out was that it had got a mold infection. And at that point, uh, there were also some strange fires in the building. And three, I know that three, um, three of the workers that were do, doing some of the building work had died, I think, or maybe the firefighters that died. But the, 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 uh, it was really odd if you, if you look at this story because the building itself was still being refitted and I think they were putting new windows in it still. The structural damage had been repaired, but I think the windows hadn't all been replaced. So these fires, such as they were, were, were quite unusual in the way, if you look at the way that they happened. So we began to wonder if there was these fires were as a result of ongoing uh, reactions in the building. And indeed, they then announced that they were going to take the building down piece by piece at a cost of uh, $70 million. And the company that did this uh, sort of uh, dismantling rather than demolition of the building uh, was a company called John Galt, who had never dismantled or demolished any buildings before in their history. I think this was their first big job. So it was a new company that did this, which was rather odd. Um, and when I went there in 2008, uh, they, I think they got down to about uh, a third of the original height, and the rest had been sort of taken down and uh, and taken taken away. So um, there is a whole thread. Um, I think it's called 130 Liberty Street is its address, if I remember that correctly. And there's a whole thread on a forum about it gives the whole history of the building, like when it was built, and you know, and uh, who we got involved in building it, and and then it ends, I think, with the destruction or the dismantling, I should say, and a uh, whole whole interesting thread of stuff. Yeah. So uh, my my conclusion is that this is an occult technology. Um, the buildings. Uh, were absolutely designed in this layout to be destroyed by this technology. And they knew that if they, it, 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 they had the field in place, so, so Norris Peary died shortly after he told me how his reactor worked, and I think he was trying to uh, take it to the next level. But in Norris Peary's reactor, he had deuterium-loaded palladium, classic cold fusion, so electrolytically loaded. He then put it into a microwave chamber, copper chamber, and he had a uh, corona discharge in there, and then he fired in microwaves, okay? And then he got every element in the periodic table, and he only had it on for two microseconds. He did the two microsecond pul pulse. If he did it any more, then it, the whole thing vaporized. <laughs> so... Um, and and it, he told me one. He told me that story, and I got it recorded, and I published it, and and uh, on on uh, SoundCloud in 2017. But it, that was only after I called him, and he was in a hospice, and he was weeks away from dying. But it was one week. It was the weekend before I realised that 9/11 was done with this technology. But it was it was in 2017 that Lion did this experiment and shared with me. Uh, this x-ray and uh, so on and I colorized it and then uh, uh, well basically it was found uh, to be an almost identical match and it, it comes down to the point that even the, the buildings over here uh, where you look at the more intense blue area here and this zone these are all destroyed but the bits on the periphery are not and again this sections of these buildings are not destroyed but the, the ones that are inside the strong field are completely gone absolutely gone right so this is literally the power of the gods i don't know any other way to put it the people that pretended they were gods that were gods to all of the ancient civilizations out there uh they knew how to use this technology i believe the reason they wanted to go and destroy those artifacts in afghanistan with the taliban to start with and then destroy the art it take and empty the museums in iraq and then go into palmyra and start destroying those things and then, then go into Yemen and and cause the the issue in in and the issues with the museums in 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 um, Egypt. I believe all of this uh, was to extract the key artifacts that sooner or later someone would work out. We're telling you exactly how this technology works and that it had been used by humans on this planet before. And so. Um, I'm, I'm now going to go on because I'm not just stopping there today, folks. I'm not stopping there. Uh, if you can bear with me, because this is going to get a lot more interesting, even than that. So uh, you want silicon and manganese in the dust? Well, if you start off with nitrogen that's in the air and iron, 
uh, that is in your building, then uh, you can have many reactions. Uh, here are the available reactions that produce silicon and oxygen here and they produce magnesium and potassium. And there we go, we've got the, your answer there. If you start off with oxygen and oxygen and you are um, doing a fusion, sorry, that should be nitrogen, nitrogen. I'm going to correct that right now. <laughs> that should be nitrogen and nitrogen. Uh, that's, that's, that's a cut and paste error from me an hour or two ago. Uh, so that should be nitrogen and nitrogen. If you fuse nitrogen and nitrogen, you get all the isotopes of silicon. Now. Uh, sorry, and, and so what is 78% of the air you're breathing? It is nitrogen. So the idea that there's a lot of silicon in the iron, uh, that huge silicon spike that they showed that they are saying is justifying the nanothermite is uh, uh, a little bit nonsense for me. Reactions of thermite. Okay, so if you start with um, nitrogen and nitrogen, these are um, equivalent to 78% of the air you're breathing right now. You get helium and magnesium. They observed magnesium in their ash, right? And you, the second reaction down is proton and aluminium, right? Well, that proton comes out and, and shares energy with the aluminium to the tune of 15.9509 million electron volts. You have a super hot proton in, and a super hot uh, aluminium atom crashing into your iron. OK, this is a synthesized aluminium. OK, it crashes into your iron and it heats the steel. The heat then, the steel has then 20 point whatever percent of oxygen left in the air and it forms iron oxide. That iron oxide and the hot aluminium atoms is about as nano, nano as you can get. This produces the effect of nanothermite. And if you look at in the eutectic sulfur in building seven. So, uh, 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 Andrew, you might talk about this, but in building seven, they found the steel was eaten away, but that it had these eutectic phases of high concentration of sulfur. But if you look at the beginning and after, firstly, there doesn't appear to be, there's oxygen in the beginning, but very little oxygen in the end. But also the building is exposed to the air. Now, we've already shown in snowballs on cobblestones where we took a Marza gas and we put it onto a copper uh, uh, um uh, uh, zinc coin, 95% copper coin, or 97% copper 10 yen coin, we actually have these little thick balls, which are plasmoids that have gone around the surface, they've eaten up the oxygen, they've converted it to sulfur. So you take oxygen out of the air or out of the steel, and you create sulfur. No nest or whoever it was that suggested this was a lot of acid rain that happened to fall on building seven whilst they were cleaning it up. It wasn't that. It wasn't that. No, it was cold fusion again. Right. Now, uh, what else did I say? Well, there, there's this very famous. Now, this is a huge giveaway, by the way, for the people that are watching this. It's an absolute massive giveaway. David, I said I'd give you something tonight. This is uh, Alexander Shishkin's cavitator, where he produces these monopoles, which look like this on an X-ray, exactly like this. And these are the same structures that Bogdanovich observed, and they're exactly the same st structures that you, uh, uh, Ritzkov observed and proved by way of iron 57 that they were magnetic monopoles. Okay, this produces bucket loads of them. Now, when Parkamov was talking, this is this is not in a presentation. This has not ever been disclosed before. Parkamov was talking out of a presentation time. There was just a general discussion about, um, uh, you know, the fact that sometimes he sees the strange radiation from his woodpecker and, and his uh, 225 data reactor, and sometimes he doesn't. OK, well, uh, he says he doesn't know why that is. Well, Alexander Shishkin turned around and said, well, what happens to my reactor is I produce these strange radiation, a huge flux, and then, and then it stops. And then to produce the strange radiation, these monopoles again, which he believes are relic neutrinos or cold neutrinos, which are condensed into these solitons. Andrew, I need you to listen to this. <laughs> Wake up. I'm listening. I'm getting tired now, but yes, I'm I, listening. I, I, I need you to listen to this. Basically, um, he he said that if I want to see these cold, uh, cold neutrinos or relic neutrinos, condensed neutrino condensates, these magnetic monopoles, again, he has to physically move his cavitator to a different part of his lab. So what I'm saying is, my assumption, and that was all he said, but everything I know about this now 
is that whatever's produced has a field that it can fall off to, right? And within that event horizon, it will condense all of the cold neutrinos that are available in that space. Now, what do we know about cold neutrinos? If you go and look at this work by Xu Wen Zhu, he showed that when you have a three body alignment, sun, moon, earth, or earth, moon, sun, you will get a change in the radioactive decay of cesium-137 or rubidium-87 atomic clocks. On 9-11, on 9-11, when the buildings were being attacked in a number of places around the world, I, I didn't find the, the source for this. They claimed it was because the consciousness of the minds of the world were focusing on the event, and that changed the rate of decay of the atomic isotopes in the atomic clocks. No, I believe that the things that were eating the building, they were absorbing vast quantities of relic neutrinos from the environment, such that there was a different flux around the atomic clocks in question, and they changed the decay rate in exactly, in exactly the same way, in exactly the same way as was observed by Xu and Zhu during three body alignments. And we already know this changes beta decay isotopes that was shown by Alexander Parkamov in his 20 years of study. That, that, reference there, that reference there was the Global Consciousness Project, where that came from, from Princeton okay. University, and it was Roger Nelson and Dean Radin that were involved in that. And yes, what they used was a, a, a random event generator, a REG, or I think somehow right. they got the name EGS. And, and yes, you're correct that that used a radioactive isotope for the random number, number generation. As, you know, I think there are a number of devices that do such things. So that's very interesting. We, I know you, you I, I'd spoken about that before with, with you, or you told me about that before with the field, you know, the field having to move the device and so forth. So um, I've, not, I've not told you about the significance. I'm, no, I'm no, you haven't. Sense. I'm making several reveals here, uh, and it's interesting. Yes, th this is absolutely critical to how the technology works. Now, uh, what what Parkamov established was that all life, all life uses relic neutrinos, and that this sucks the air out of the room. This is chi. This is chi. And when you look at the interview with Boyd Bushman, not so long before he died, he's referring to a new form of energy type that Lockheed Martin are investigating that's way beyond fission, okay? And in that same conversation, he's talking about John Hutchison and the neutrino-verse. The neutrino-verse is not, is not neutrinos coming from the sun, relic, uh, 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 decay, you know, uh, uh, relativistic neutrinos. It's the relic neutrinos. He's talking mm. about those. He's connecting John Hutchison's work with an energy source that's well, well beyond um, uh, fission and fusion. And that Lockheed Martin were investigating it, and it's to do with the neutrino burst. Those three things are connected together. And I am telling you that this one off-the-cuff comment by Alexander Shishkin is saying that he sucked all of the neutrinos out of the field of influence of his cavitator. And that to get it to work, he had to move it to a different part of his lab. In the case of the buildings, when they were eating, they did that. Now, there's one other thing we can fix with this same concept, the magnetometers. Now, these were in Alaska, weren't they? You can maybe talk to that, uh, Andrew. There were seven magnetometers. Yeah, I think yeah, there were six or seven instruments at various points. Um, and uh, those are documented on somewhere on Dr. Wood's website. So yeah, they're just measuring the the um, sort of um, direction of the Earth's magnetic field with a very sensitive instrument, so they can tell, you know, whether it's sort of dipping south or dipping north or whatever, or you know, the orientation of it. And uh, we saw that deflection. I think the most obvious one was at eight forty six, with the supposed um, first impact, and that's that's quite indicative of. Um, in not being a plane, in other words, there was some type of discharge event or something triggered at exactly 846. But again, if you look at that particular trace, you can see that it, um, it this, the, the actual buildup of whatever it was started about 20 minutes before the, the, the alleged impact and, and, and then continued for, I think, another... Uh, we're, it's looking at these graphs here. So you can see the, the mm. before and after kind of things, and then you've got the... The hits of the buildings and then the the the, the, the effect afterwards. Right. 
Right, and that went on throughout the day, and you can isolate various uh, events, you know, within the magnetometer readings, which have a, seem to have a pretty strong correlation and correspondence with events like, you know, the destruction of Tower 7 and so forth. So, yeah, it's, it's all very interesting. So what I'm saying is that what we have observed in Vega experiments is that you build up these self-coherent uh, uh, structures and then you energize and you energize them and energize them and they don't seem to do anything. And then they do everything extremely quickly. And we have not only seen them cut a piece of tungsten and we've seen them cut iron, uh, sorry, uh, copper and nickel and titanium. We've also seen them burn around the, the tungsten right? Literally like eating through that building. We've literally seen the same, but it doesn't do anything until it gets to a certain level of coherence. And I believe what's happening is at the point it becomes coherent, it forms the massive monopole structure. And then, then it's eating the building. And it wasn't until they finally got rid of World Trade Center 7 here that it went back to normal because it went into the ground in a few seconds and then the monopole was underground, the electrons dissipated, it becomes uh, incoherent, and it returns back to a flat line. This is, my friends, exactly how, in my movie, I would use science based on experiments to explain the, the hypothesis behind the observations on the day. It is this technology that I would use in my movie if I was to make a movie about this day. Now, I'm not going to stop there. It's going to get even more interesting. So this is in a cavitator. Okay. And uh, from in this cavitator, we see around the eye of Horus, which is a little bit less resolved here, um, we see these spheres. And from the spheres, we see the strange radiation tracks coming out. So these are coherent matter structure, and it's shutting, sh shooting out uh, coherent matter uh, traveling wave beams from the structure okay now why i'm showing you this is because this is one of the many times that i saw spheres but it also i need to show you this because uh, we are going to tie together um if it's going to let me load it uh, we are going to tie together all of the radioactive isotopes that were claimed to be, uh, explain the um how should we put this? The uh, uh, the nuclear theory by I think it's Jim Fetzer that was the main proponent of that. Am I right in saying that? Well, the, 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 I mean, we could spend a whole hour talking about. It. Basically, the nuke theory came out. Uh, I think the earliest I recorded it was two thousand and eight with a guy called Ed Ward. Then it had a reboot um, with Dmitry Karlazov, who did this like sixteen hour video or something, and I think in around about. I don't know, 2009, I think it was. And then it got rebooted again by another guy in 2012 called Jeff Prager. So there's been various incarnations of this hot nuke theory. And uh, then the most the most recent one was this Heinz Pomner, who I think was talking about some type of neutron bomb type uh, nuke that, that he, he was saying. But, you know, it, it, I didn't really study that very much because I knew it was bogus from the get-go, you know. So this is uh, Mark Clare's uh, nanospile presentation from 2012. I'd just like to say at the top of this, the water crystal, which is this structure that he believes is produced in cavitation. He says, cavitation, water crystal, molecular structure, and proposed Brown's gas seed. Okay? So he's, he's saying that this is the structure that allows... So when I'm saying that the, the cavitation is producing material, I only saw this today. I, this is me finding out that Leclerc had recognized previously that whatever it is that's producing this, these hydrodynamic structures leads to the formation of something that leads to the dense gas in Brown's gas. And uh, people may or may not know that he observed all kinds of forms of strange radiation. Uh, most interestingly, he observed most of the material uh, uh, producing carbon. Uh, and he, he does say that in this presentation that, uh, it, where is it here? This is diamond. This is a diamond film on here. And, uh, uh, this is all kind of diamond in here. In one of these slides, he talks about basically how it's all uh, most mostly diamond that it produces. Okay, so here's some strange radiation tracks, various tracks, and this is material that's outputting strange radiation tracks after it's finished. Um, 
here's okay so here is the majority of transmuted material was diamond so this is exactly what i observed coming out of uh, 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 that i shared on my uh, dead coherent matter traveling wave in a, a recent experiment um that we did uh, uh, that that hank did in holland so thank you hank um, but yes, he observed diamond formation, and I believe that this is all part of the same story. Um, but he observed every element in the periodic table, uh, including, if you go here, uh, uranium, neptunium, uh, plutonium, californium. And so uh, we know that Lena produces uh, tritium. And we know that coherent matter, which I believe is what's going on in cavitation as well, uh, produces all of the radioactive isotopes if you push it too far. And so uh, every observation, the tritium, which is like meant to be, I think it was 50 times background levels. And some people said, oh, yeah, maybe there was tritium in some of the uh, exit signs in the building to illuminate them. Uh, that was one excuse, I think, that was given, right? But no, Lena was proven to produce tritium in Barotomic Research Center, and Tom Clayton uh, uh, showed it in, in a corona discharge um, and he got the award, the Pre Preparator Award, in I think June in 2016 or 17. Uh, yeah, 2017. I was standing next to him when he got it. Um, uh, and so it produces tritium. This is Lena that produces tritium. This is Lena that produces all of the signatures. And by the way, here you can see this massive lead spike, which also Adamenko observed. So the, it, the, I think it was a very large increase in the lead, if I'm right in saying, uh, Andrew. In, in the dust from 9-11 when they did the study? I wasn't familiar with the, uh, all the details of the various um, composition. I don't remember lead okay, being a so thing. I've got it here. And so right. it's, on, it's on page 371 of where okay. the files go. And the analysis shows that the lead concentration, uh, where is it, over here, was uh, 1,003, 1,300, 1,400 times higher. Okay, I didn't know that. Uh, the element uh, W Trade Center element after and the W Trade Center uh, element mm -hmm. before. Interesting, yes. Stuff. And so the, the, one of the highest, one of the most easy to produce elements is uh, a lead, and, and there it is. So, um, and also you can see in his work that the, the most produced, interestingly, was zinc, which you've got uh, here. And zinc was uh, 3,400 times higher. And you can see that zinc actually is synthesized more than uh, lead. And I think it's uh, getting on for a, ma a mag uh, order of magnitude and, and a half higher, which is, a, yeah, it's basically consistent with uh, the observation of before and after in the lead. So um, th this is a coherent matter structure uh, 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 technology. And, and uh, so there we go. So mm. that's that done. Um, <laughs> so we, we, we don't have to worry about nanothermite. Uh, so what have we done? The planes are a, a crop of thing in my, my movie. Uh, the, the nanothermite is unnecessary in my movie. Uh, in my movie, you don't have to worry about uh, the nuclear technology. So we can forget about that. Uh, it is low energy nuclear reactions. So let's have a look to see what it looks like when this technology impinges upon, you guessed it, I did it. I went to the Imperial War Museum and I took my microscope and I sat down with a window from the North Tower. Yes, there's people walking around, but uh, this is science. So here we are, this is the window uh, beam from the North Tower. I, I cut out the propaganda that was surrounding this bit of text. <laughs> <laughs> which was telling which was telling you exactly the the plain story and the, the the poor muslims who who in my movie the muslims would just be patsies right they're, they're just someone to blame it on right that's in my movie now the, the truth might be that they really were the people that did it okay but in my movie they were patsies yeah so this steel window frame was lifted from the ruins of the North Tower. The burnt and twisted metal still graphically expresses the sickening violence that destroyed the buildings. Now, to be fair, I have seen buildings demolished in Brno where the steel looks still twisted and buckled like this. Not in some of the other more weird ways that they're twisted and buckled, but I have seen steel at a demolition site of about this size, which looks a bit crunched like this. Okay. 
Um, and that's on a building that was only six stories high. But what is interesting is when you start looking in a little bit closer, which I did, of course I would do, wouldn't I? Um, because what do we see? Now, bear in mind, I told you that this is not the first time I saw this. This is on a ultra, this is on an ultrasonically cavitated producing fuel that produced spheres that produce coherent matter traveling waves coming out of them. Okay. This is what they see. In the Lion reactor, we also saw many, many spheres produced, even magnetic spheres that were uh, uh, teleporting from the inside to the outside of the reactor. What do we see when we look at some of this steel close up? Okay. Now, forget the two spots down here. We won't talk about the two spots down here. We're going to have a look at some of this material that's been eaten away with these kind of like waves. It's got these waves eaten away, a bit like the, the part of the 10 yen coin that's been eaten away. Now, you might say it's just been torn away and this is a weld, but maybe that is the case. But let's let's have a look at it. There are these pits which are very regular. Now, I would have just looked at this and said this is rust, um, but... Since then, I've noticed how these plasmoids self-organize and they self-organize very similarly to this structure. Whether that's important, I don't know. But what we did do then is go and have a look with a microscope at 400 times. And what do we see? We see spheres in cavities and it is absolutely everywhere, everywhere. And I can tell you, I'm gonna, I, I, I was here looking at this building, and I was nervous as hell. I was so nervous. And I thought, I, I, do I really want to see what's on this, this window? Do I really, really, in my heart, heart want to see? And I, I said, I've got, I've got to face it. I've got to face it. And all I was hoping for is to not see spheres. That's all I wanted, to, 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 to put this to bed and say, this is not the technology that was using this. So, so in the back of my mind, I was saying, please don't show me any spheres. And then what do I see? I see absolutely in cavities, spheres, absolutely everywhere. In example, after example, look at the sphere here, this structure here, the spheres, absolutely, two little spheres on the top of this, the head of the structure here. In this cavity here, a sphere at the bottom, all over here, little, little, little one over here. Here, here. I mean, I, I actually shared this video a couple of years ago, about three years ago, around probably around 9-11 or on my tweet 991 from from the, but I, it was a silent movie. And there's another silent movie I shared on this day last year, which I'm going to look at. But the spheres are in the cavities. Now, these are either carbon rich, like were found on the inside of the lion reactor, or they're silicon rich, like were found in the ball lightning structures that came out of the microwave plasma uh, um, reactor that I that was built by Dr. George Eagley et al. When when I saw this, I, I it was all I could do to stop stop crying, honestly, because I did I honestly did not want to see this. Cavities everywhere with the sphere structures inside them. Anyway, the the they're absolutely everywhere, absolutely. Wherever you looked, the material had been eaten away uh, by what I believe are these coherent matter structures, and this is the aftermath. Um, so anyone can go and look at a sample uh, of, a, of, of the Twin Towers, a genuine sample, and you know there's a thing, range of things that they can do. The, the 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 thing is that the the, the whole nanothermite argument it, it it relies on one thing, believing that a person that said that they were accused about uh, uh, sending samples out to the labs, who worked for the the organisation who said that uh, who he said that they could make it without admitting he worked for them, you're relying on him, not having spiked the samples or the person that gave him the samples, not having spiked the samples. I mean, who gave the samples to him? <laughs> you know what I mean? And may maybe the story is out there about who gave the samples or the official story that who gave the samples. But anyway, um, for, for me, it was, it was a, 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 a terrible shock when I, when I saw this, because I already knew, this, look at this, this structure up here. I mean, I knew what I'm looking at, having seen it in so many different Lena ex experiments, and that was so sad. But then um, 
on the 11th of September 2020, I shared uh, this uh, video of this structure. And without having a full chain of custody, I'm understood, I was understood that this is supposedly uh, was extracted from ground zero. And uh, I have SEMs of this, which I'm going to share with you now. And uh, I'm gonna, it's gonna, I'm gonna find it difficult not to cry. I just think of all the people that have died and all the freedoms that have been taken away to hide this technology and what they're doing right now to make sure it doesn't come out. It just. It kills me. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so uh, give me a second. I'm just going to find it. Uh, maybe, Andrew, you would like to um, discuss an aspect uh, that I uh, did. We did we cover everything. I think I think we're basically going to nail nine eleven. I can. Yeah, I mean, I think you know what you what you've covered there is uh, pretty pretty comprehensive. Um, yeah. Okay. You know. Um, I think the one thing which you'd shown me before, um, which was quite interesting, was that picture of where you know you are you were arguing that the um, that the structure or the coherent matter correct, correct me if I've got terminology wrong has, has kind of like ended up in the rock, and you'd got that circular sort of spirally type pattern in the rock. Yeah, I think you will have shown that on other others of your presentations, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that I thought was was something of a of a compelling image too. And yes, it, it is. I take uh, you know your your words about the, uh, the 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 way that this technology is being used and uh, the, the 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 extent to which they've gone to keep it covered up, and uh, you know f f f really here. And I don't mean this in a bad way, but the, you know, the, what there are six of us all together, so they didn't really care about those sorts of numbers, um, you know, of people. So the, this this may get uh, free range, you know, and where it goes, and also some of it is quite technical. Uh, so I think it's harder for those well, with it. Well, what I'm what I'm showing, for instance, in the last thing is something that anyone who thinks that they're qualification for however qualified they are thinks that it's worth more than soiled toilet paper mm. they can go into the 9-11 museum mm. and they can get that bible that's fused to molten steel as the photographer said right in his description of this bible which is not even singed and they can have a look at that steel and see what they see on the steel and i'm not talking about the elemental oh. composition i'm talking about the arrangement of the elements the structures that they're on there. This is a phenomenological mm. process, and it produces the same structures on multiple fractal scales wherever it goes. It has an in. This is why, in my view, they removed all of the steel they could possibly do from 9/11. That no one was allowed to touch it. They tracked the buses. You could, maybe you could talk a bit about that whilst I'm finding this SEM data. So that was my understanding. It's not something I have specific documents about, but it appears that there was a very close um, monitoring of, of the removal of this debris. And uh, I think the, the, the what they were stating was that, oh, yes, well, obviously, this is a crime scene. So, you know, this is all forensic evidence, blah, blah, blah. But actually, uh, you know, that, that, that we was never investigated, you know, not not properly. Um, I think there were a few bits and bobs that were picked up and looked at, but it was never investigated in the way that uh, Dr. Wood had investigated it or, you know, some of the investigations you've done. It was n never investigated like that at all. So it does make you wonder. Well, I what think that it was a track... Senate, Senate or, or House hearing where they, they pulled the people in and said, look, this is the biggest crime scene on US soil in history and no one is allowed to look at the evidence. Mm. You, you've literally taken it all away. Mm. Where and they they don't even know where it went. Well, some of it went to fresh kills, but and some of some of the steel was kept, kept by a company called W J E. But you know there may have been other pieces and uh, items that were whisked away to Los Alamos or somewhere like that, and uh, you know various facilities for further study and testing and to see how well things had actually panned out for them. You know I, I don't know. That's just speculation on my part, of course. 
Okay, so I'm I'm nearly there. So uh, if you can just fill for me for a little while, we, we're gonna we're gonna have mm. a conclusion slide once I've shown this. But, sure. Um, yeah. So I mean, you know, as I say, we do know that some of the steel uh, ended up at WJ, um, and uh, I think that was where, uh, for example, Jesse Ventura, who made this documentary in 2006, he actually went to to this warehouse where they were keeping some of it, and I don't think they allowed him in, but he was filming through one of the windows. And again, I don't know how much of this he was hamming it. Up, but uh, um, you know, we do know that some of it has been kept under wraps, and uh, as you said, some of it has been put in this uh, weird uh, museum at Ground Zero, where you now have to pay to uh, twenty-four dollars or whatever the price is now to um, you know to, to get propagandized. And um, <laughs> you know, it's, I, like, uh, I like the way you're putting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty. I went there as I say in 2017. I didn't go into the museum. And uh, I ended up, there was a security chap wandering around the site and ended up having a chat to him. And I said, right. do you want to know what happened? And uh, he says, well, I'm, I'm willing to listen, you know. And so I, I chatted to him for about five, ten minutes, showed him a few pictures on my phone and yeah. gave him a leaflet and, uh, and off he went, you know. So uh, here we have our structure that we, we uh, similar to what we've observed on mm. other samples. Um, and... Uh, the open dendritic structure we have seen on the uh, coherent nuclear uh, transmission experiments of Solim. But um, we do have to bear in mind that when, when brass recrystallizes, it will produce a dendritic structure anyway. Um, but it's interesting that this is uh, open cell uh, dendritic structure. Um, but what I'm interested in is this area that's been consumed in this particular uh, shape on the key and what you are seeing in its surrounding area which if you will see are these alternating spots but what i'm going to do is i'm going to focus in in this area in particular um and i get i need to go to a different directory <laughs> and um And we will look at this one. So this is the key that I gave you, yeah? Yes, that's the key I gave you gave me. So yeah, so we as Bob said, we're not entirely, entirely sure of the provenance of this, but uh, it's, um, it's meant, meant to have come from ground. Yeah, we understand it did come from uh, the World Trade Center on 9/11, and uh, looking so, at the uh, way these are, and I'll show you in a second. Uh, these are essentially just lead. Uh, or mostly lead, but it's these structures, the ones that are raised, that I'm most interested in. And the reason I'm interest, most interested in is not necessarily because of their content. It's because they are moving across the sur surface, leaving trails. So you can see it's got a head here, it's got a little bit of a tail on it, and then it leaves these lines, trail lines. There's another one down here that's come along here and, and scooped out this channel and, and, and come up and rested in this crevice here. And there's another one here that's kind of liquefied the material that it's surrounding it. And I believe that these were plasmoids, just like we saw on the snowballs on cobblestones, and just like you have seen in my last presentation on the Vega Valley, uh, which is clearly a fluidized electron uh, uh, structure that's doing the transmutation there. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the material in this, and hopefully I can do it quickly by this method. It's going to let me do that. So we're going to I'm going to put that one over there, so you can see that like that, and we'll put this over here, maybe. So I'm hopefully I've zoomed in. I've got the SEM on the right area this time. Okay. Um, so essentially, we are looking at. It's going to do it. Right it's really slowing down now. <laughs> right. So we are okay. So we've just caught the tail end of this uh, plasmoid, in my view, this one here. So you can see the trails coming out, and we're going to have a look mm -hmm. at what that is. So you can see that on the carbon, it's rich in carbon, 
Uh, and so that's the, the plasmoid there. And you can see that this structure over here uh, also has some carbon, but um, is it the one in the center? Is it the one in the center here? It doesn't have anything, but if we go to the lead image, where's the lead? Lead, lead, lead. So there we go, ped, lead, okay. Okay, you can see how strong that lead is. So the lead is very, very strong. So if I switch between the carbon there, so this, this, this is a miner here, this miner here, and this is a miner here, this is a miner here. Okay, they're, they're built up onto the surface. And these have high carbon concentration. And you can see the lead inclusion here, uh, uh, if I go to the lead image, is basically there. And the, these ones have less lead. They do have some lead, but they have less lead. You see, this, this one is this one, which is all lead. This one lead, this one lead. And these are the two miners, this miner here and this miner here. Um, when I when I saw this uh, in uh, when it was in uh, two thousand and nineteen, I, I I really honestly didn't know how to to break it to the community. But I had only seen, you know, um, the miners in the core of the lion eating diamond and transmuting the matter. And uh, let me just put up the carbon there. Uh, yeah, you can see, I'll just show you the copper here for, for a minute so you can get it. So the copper is basically an inverse. Copper, lead, carbon. You see, there's literally no carbon here. <laughs> but there is lead in the miners. So the miners do like to either synthesize lead or capture lead. Um, so... Uh, when I saw this, I, I thought, I, don't, I don't, really don't know how to break this to community because, uh, I, like I say, I've seen the miners in the lime. And at the same time as analyzing this, I was, uh, where was where else was I seeing the, the plasmoids? It was, it was in the 10 yen coin. So I had the, the lime reactor, which I'd already seen these things moving around, consuming matter. And I'd seen it um, in the... Uh, uh, 10, 10 yen coin since i did this in uh 2000 or around about in 2019 we, we had the the data published um by bogdanovich et al uh, observing these things moving around on surfaces um uh two two days afterwards and i'd already known from 2018 that these things can live in metals uh, for months and from our own work for months and from shoulders for years. Um, but for me, this, this what, what you're seeing here, this, this miner that I'm showing you here, moving around on the surface, uh, I would believe that this is a slightly collapsed itonic cluster. And this is the trail behind it. And what you're witnessing up here uh, is the carbon content. And as Leclerc found, as we have found, as Matsumoto found, uh, as your brown found, whatever you give it, it ends up producing mostly carbon. And so there we go. Uh, in my movie, cold fusion, coherent nuclear transmutation, and ball lightning technology was used to take down the Twin Towers. It is unequivocal, well, unequivocal a very, very good scientific basis for my movie. Not the planes. Not the dustification with the, the thermite, not the nuclear bomb, but cold fusion. And I think um, Andrew Johnson's work uh, with, with uh, um, Judy Wood, I said I thought this was probably the best, best book of this century. Um, I believe it is. Um, and uh, this is the what happened with the suggestion of potentially what could explain it. And I hope that during the course of this presentation, I've shown you sufficient evidence, which you can verify. You can go and choose to verify if you wish your, your qualifications to be worth something. Um, there, there is enough evidence in this presentation to show unequivocally that I have a good scientific basis for my movie of how 9-11 happened. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, this is the time to ask it. Uh, 
Uh, I'll take some quick quick questions. Maybe uh, you'd like to ask some questions of Andrew. Uh, Andrew has a huge wealth of experience coming at this from a different angle. So if you want to come in and speak, that would be fine. If yeah, before like yeah, that. I'll just uh, add a, add a couple of points and thank you for putting all that together. It's extremely interesting, and I think particularly the. Uh, the key at the end there, I, would, I obviously, we, I, I, you know, we'd spoken a bit about that, but that's really interesting what you've managed to uh, get from the uh, the actual uh, inspection of that. It's really, it's, really it's, good. It's different now because I, yeah. I'm on the verge of being able to film these things. But Bob right. has filmed them, right? Right. But for, for me, uh, this, this, the idea that this key probably came from 911, I think it almost certainly did. Because yeah. you have yeah. this structure, which is the structure shape, that you should get from this technology. And in that structure shape, you have these things that are on the outside, consuming the matter and transmuting them, just as they did on the monopole in the 10 yen coin, just as yeah. they did in that 10 yen coin, doing the transmutation. And the and transmutation they're doing it to is the transmutation observed by many authors uh, over decades. Uh, and going back to Dr. Judy Wood's book, I mean, that's that's been pretty much entirely her own work. There were a few bits and bobs which I discussed with her um, one of which we haven't really mentioned tonight, but I think you've mentioned it prior in, in your earlier presentations is, for example, the uh, relationship to some of the uh, energy uh, forms that maybe you maybe you know that have been found in crop circles, um, which I think ties into the some of the some level as well. So I'd, I'd mentioned that to Dr. Wood and she ended up putting some of that in the book as she put her own information together on that but um but i didn't really have a lot to do with the book i i am a, 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 have been acted as a european distributor for it and of course as i said i've written two books about the cover-up of her research and how you know the whole jones thing which i mentioned earlier on which we've we've discussed tonight obviously so so uh but my my role has been more one of um carrying the torch you might say i think uh, th than anything else and i think it's what you've done here as regards the um you've really fleshed out the the whole thing about transmutation and the energy forms and the ken shoulder stuff and stuff I mean, a lot of that is is, is is really really good that you've uh, sort of fleshed all of that out and uh yeah so uh yeah, but if anybody's got any questions, uh, I'm happy to hang around for a bit and answer them, and then I'm going to shoot off to bed. Yeah, me, me too. And also, um, I'd be happy to write a book and write this up, uh, and uh, you know, along the theme of you know, you know, there's th three narratives out there, but let's have another one of how this could have happened. Um, so, if if you're up for that, uh, I think I think the, in my view, this is a cult. Uh, ancient technology the reason we went into the middle east adventures was to destroy the evidence of its prior existence and i think they failed because they couldn't get fully into syria they couldn't get into damascus and i think there's significant evidence there and i think there's massive massive evidence in iran and it, a lot of it's still buried um because they're still digging up things and i when i when i talk about the evidence from iran compared to what we're actually observing repeatedly in experiments it's just going to blow people's minds i mean I, you know i accepted 9 11 was probably done by with this by 2017 by the end of 2019 having seen the bogdanovich work seeing all of these transmutations the same patterns and then having seen this key in combination with the balls uh, uh, on the the 10 yen coin um, it, it was like, you know, people are going to have to f come to terms with this. It just is what it is. <laughs> um, and look at the beauty. What you saw is the awesome power re replicated on the same day of what this technology can do. Um, and you can understand why they're willing to literally scorch the earth and use any means necessary to prevent this from coming out. Whoever's got command, there's other things that this technology can do, which I've not never gone into. And um, you, you can understand why they would want to protect it. Mm. I, I almost don't blame them, but because, uh, but I, I think if everyone, it's like, the, like when the, everyone had the nuke that were threatening each other, like when Russia and, the, and America had the nuke, no one shot a nuke because it's mis assured mutual destruction. The, the problem with this technology is they can't steadily wind turbines. They can't flood rainforests producing loads of methane to produce electricity. They can't sell you on solar panels and wind because it makes all of those things completely irrelevant. You know, 
you can have a Tesla car that's driven by Tesla technology and never needs to be recharged again. It doesn't even need to have the batteries. It, you know, so the, all so many businesses are, would be completely wiped out. So basically, they have to find a way to control every person on the planet so they can force us to take crap technologies. <laughs> that's, it's the only conclusion I can come to because they absolutely do not want to let the gods toolbox to the, for us poor peasants. Uh, that, that's my, my view. So they they can, absolutely cannot let this out, <laughs> whoever they are. I'm not interested in who they are. I'm interested in the science. You know, that's always been my perspective. You know, what is going on? How, how did it happen? Not who did it, because anyone who had this technology would be tempted to use it <laughs> in, in evil ways. Because it is, there's no, it, it, as, as Boyd Bushman intimated, this is, or this is the end of the road for what you can do with our universe. Um, sorry, I, I just talked there. Is, is anyone interested in talking? Because otherwise I'm going to wrap this up with one light, light, last slide. I'll shut these down. I think if no one's got any questions, I'm just going to close down with one slide, the last slide. Yeah. This, this I see this piece of material here with what it what it has inside it as a, a pure work of art. And it I, I said when I when I I published this as the key on on I think it was post 911 on Twitter on, on the MFMP's Twitter. And by the way, none of these things that I'm saying are the views of the MFMP and the other directors. This is this is my my view in my own personal capacity. However, um, this is intrinsically linked to cold fusion, and it is intrinsically linked to what happened to Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons. And uh, uh, so I shared this on the 11th of September 2020. Here we are. It's still the, in the US and even in the UK. It's still the 11th of September 2021. I'm going to close out before it finishes there. So 9-11-Y in my movie. In my movie, it was to pitch religion against religion and people against people for profit. It was to control minds and take away freedoms through misplaced fear for profit. To keep a monopoly on the O-based technology they were now mastering and to use it to force subservience. To justify going into the Middle East and destroy capture as much evidence as possible that this technology is timeless and has been used on earth before to be able to fake in an alien invasion and global warming and carry out what is called disaster capitalism for extortion and profit such as earthquakes tsunamis volcanic eruptions heat waves floods and hurricanes to hold dominion over us and prevent us from achieving our destiny which is to reach for the stars and i wrote that in January 2018, before I'd even seen the key that I just showed you. So thank you guys uh, for listening. Uh, I will publish this. Um, uh, David Davis, I hesitate to say I'm seeing similar in Triple Electric experiments. Well, you will do in Triple Electric, David, because uh, Triple Electric will produce coherence because it produces charge separation, which leads to coherence. Um, and uh, actually, I think Shoulders talk about, talked about it with tri uh, Triple Electric. Um, tri Triple Electric is known to produce uh, soft X-rays, and it produces soft X-rays because it's the matter cohering, producing the soft X-rays, <laughs> exactly what was burning uh, uh, Piantelli's arm uh, when he turned on his nickel hydrogen reactor uh, in, in the 1990s. So... Uh, um, I, I think I, I look, look, I've looked at 9-11 as, I mean, I left my country because of the wars in the Middle East. I couldn't stand to live in a country that was uh, supporting or allowing the support of the killing uh, and displacement of millions of people. And uh, so that's the principal reason, the final straw that meant I left my country. Um, and I love it to bits, uh, but it's not it's not the people's fault. Um, but the evidence that I've shared tonight, uh, I don't even think it's that complicated. And, and I, I think that uh, if there's going to ever be success in known genetic reactions of coherent nuclear transmutation and ball lightning, as I now call it, um, 
they are going to come across this effect. And sooner or later, as, as Ken Shoulder said in disruption.pdf, it is inevitable that these effects will be discovered. And anyone that knows that you go down the cold fusion route, you will do and end up with an experiment like Pons and Fleischman did a couple of years before they shared their announcement, which is they had a ball, one cc ball that went through their thing and turned a lot of the concrete into fine particles that suspended themselves in the air, which means they must be pretty much like nanoparticles. So, you know, this what happened that day in my movie based on science, which Boyd Bushman says exists, and which uh, um, the US Navy patent says exists, and which the Lockheed Martin patent says exists, um, there is a scientific basis for this. And samples from the actual event match the technology that can do the science that they are claiming they can do amazing things with, including cloaking, matter wave emission and propulsion, directed energy weapons, and destroying planets. Okay, so I think probably, uh, I think we're done really, uh, Andrew. Um, yes, I think so. And uh, I'll just add that I think your last slide there, I'd, I'd actually got a presentation that says something very similar to that, actually. So that's really? quite interesting. For, yeah, that was, I put together around the same time, I think. So yeah, it's, I have similar thoughts and conclusions to what you put there. I mean, it, it, essentially what we're talking about is an ancient technology. And uh, I, I think, actually, to, to, to lay the cards on the table, I'm absolutely certain that this is what the Knights Templar were looking for, uh, uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church wanted to find. And I'm absolutely certain, uh, certain that a certain German uh, dictator um, around the 1930s and 40s was trying to find in North Africa and the Middle East. I'm absolutely certain that this is the technology that everyone was after. Um, and I believe that when it was rediscovered, um, they didn't want us to know that this can, this happens, but it happens. It even happens in your own body, but we use it in a gentle way. Um, so I think that's that's it for me today. Thank you, uh, uh, Andrew, for joining. Um, it's a shame John, John did say he would try and join in but uh he, he didn't make it and, and it's possibly because of the format it's harder um but uh thank you very very much um uh for taking the time i know it's uh, late for you and thank to our artifact david and shane and plq uh we will publish this uh when i can okay okay so thank you thank you everyone it's been fantastic. Hopefully the recording is there and I can publish it and that would be great. So um, cheers. Very mate. good. It's been, okay. an interesting, it's been an interesting journey. And, and for those that don't know, uh, um, on this journey, we've, but we've both had some ups and downs, haven't we? Uh, Andrew and Andrew's just suffered Absolutely. a big down, but uh, um, uh, full respect for him. Um, uh, he's, he's always taken my calls, even when they've been lengthy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's been an ear to, to to run ideas past and so i th thank you very much uh, from the bottom of my heart and uh, i hope that it doesn't take another 20 years for people to see what this is um it's it's the hugest opportunity that man has had since we were last using this mm. and i don't think it should be held back from humanity anymore i think if if everyone's on a level playing field and they realize this is the case because uh, anyway, I think everyone should be on a loving playing field and, and see it for what it is. It should be revealed. It should be revealed. So thank you, guys. Thank you, Andrew. Good night. Thank you, Bob. Bye for now. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye.